Chapter Eleven of Home Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morse Earle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Girls' Occupations Hatchling and Carding, Spinning and Reeling, Weaving and Bleaching, Cooking, Candle and Cheese Making were not the only household occupations of our busy grandmothers when they were young. A score of domestic duties kept ever busy their ready hands. Some notion of the qualifications of a housekeeper over a century ago may be obtained from this advertisement in the Pennsylvania packet of September twenty third, seventeen eighty, quote, wanted at a seat about half a day's journey from Philadelphia, on which are good improvements and domestics, a single woman of unsullied reputation an affable cheerful active and amiable disposition cleanly industrious perfectly qualified to direct and manage the female concerns of country business as raising small stock dairying marketing combing carding spinning knitting sewing pickling, preserving, etc., and occasionally to instruct two young ladies in those branches of economy who, with their father, compose the family. Such a person will be treated with respect and esteem, and meet with every encouragement due to such a character." Unquote respect and esteem forsooth and due encouragement to such a miracle of saintliness and capacity light terms indeed to apply to such a character there is in the library of the connecticut historical society a diary written by a young girl of colchester connecticut in the year seventeen seventy five her name was Abigail Foote. She set down her daily work, and the entries run like this. Quote, Fix gown for Prudy, men mother's riding hood, spun short thread, fix two gowns for Welch's girls, carded toe, spun linen, worked on cheese basket, hatcheled flax with Hannah, we did fifty-one pounds apiece, pleated and ironed, read a sermon of Doddridge's, spooled apiece, milked the cows, spun linen, did fifty knots, made a broom of guinea wheat straw, spun thread to whiten, set a red dye, had two scholars from Mrs. Taylor's. I carded two pounds of whole wool and felt nationally, spun harness twine, scoured the pewter." Unquote. She tells also of washing, cooking, knitting, weeding the garden, picking geese, etc and of many visits to her friends. She dipped candles in the spring and made soap in the autumn. This latter was a trying and burdensome domestic duty, but the soft soap was important for home use. All the refuse grease from cooking, butchering, etc., was stored through the winter as well as wood ashes from the great fireplaces. 
the first operation was to make the lie to quote, set the leech unquote. many families owned a strongly made leech barrel others made a sort of barrel from a section of the bark of the white birch this barrel was placed on bricks or set at a slight angle on a circular groove in a wood or stone base then filled with ashes water was poured in till the lye trickled or leached out through an outlet cut in the groove into a small wooden tub or bucket the water and ashes were frequently replenished as they wasted and the lye accumulated in a large tub or kettle if the lye was not strong enough it was poured over fresh ashes an old-time recipe says quote, the great difficulty in making soap come is the want of judgment of the strength of the lye if your lye will bear up an egg or a potato so you can see a piece of the surface as big as a ninepence it is just strong enough unquote. the grease and lye were then boiled together in a great pot over a fire out of doors it took about six bushels of ashes and twenty-four pounds of grease to make a barrel of soap the soft soap made by this process seemed like a clean jelly and showed no trace of the repulsive grease that helped to form it a hard soap also was made with the tallow of the bayberry and was deemed especially desirable for toilet use but little hard soap was purchased even in city homes it was a common saying quote, we had bad luck with our soap unquote, or good luck the soap was always carefully stirred one way the quote, pennsylvania dutch unquote, used a sassafras stick to stir it a good smart worker could make a barrel of soap in a day and have time to sit and rest in the afternoon and talk her luck over before getting supper this soft soap was used in the great monthly washings which for a century after the settlement of the colonies seemed to have been the custom the household wash was allowed to accumulate and the washing done once a month or in some households once in three months thomas tusser's rhymed instructions to good housekeepers as to the washing contain chiefly warnings to the housekeeper against thieves thus quote, dry sun dry wind safe bind safe fine go wash well say it's summer and sun i shall dry go ring well say it winter with wind so shall i to trust without heed is to venture a joint give tally and take count is a housewifely point Unquote. abigail foot wrote of making a broom of guinea wheat this was not broom corn for that useful plant was not grown in connecticut for the purpose of broom making till twenty years or more after she wrote in her diary brooms and brushes were made of it in italy nearly two centuries ago benjamin franklin who was ever quick to use and develop anything that would benefit his native country and was ever ready to take a hint noted a few seeds of broom corn hanging on an imported brush 
he planted these seeds and raised some of the corn and thomas jefferson placed broom corn among the productions of virginia in seventeen eighty one by this time many had planted it but no systematic plan of raising broom corn abundantly for the manufacture of brooms was planned until seventeen ninety eight when levi dickinson a yankee farmer of hadley massachusetts planted half an acre from this he made between one and two hundred brooms which he peddled in a horse cart in neighboring towns the following year he planted an acre and the tall broom corn with its spreading panicles attracted much attention though he was thought visionary when he predicted that broom manufacture would be the greatest industry in the county and though he was sneeringly told that only indians ought to make brooms he persevered and his neighbors finally planted and made brooms also he carried brooms soon to pittsfield to new london and in eighteen o five to albany and boston so rapid was the increase of manufacture that in eighteen ten seventy thousand brooms were made in the county since then millions of dollars worth have gone forth from the farms and villages in his neighborhood mr dickinson at first scraped the seed from the brush with a knife then he used a sort of hoe then a coarse comb like a ripple comb he tied each broom by hand with the help of a negro servant much of this work could be done by little girls who soon gave great help in broom manufacture though the final sewing when the needle was pressed through with a leather palm such as sailors use had to be done by the strong hands of grown women and men doubtless abigail foot made many an indian broom as well as her brooms of guinea wheat which may have been a special home manufacture of her neighborhood for many fibers leaves and straws were used locally in broom making another duty of women of the old-time household was the picking of domestic geese geese were raised for their feathers more than as food in some towns every family had a flock and their clanking was heard all day and sometimes all night they roamed the streets all summer eating grass by the highways and wallowing in the puddles sometimes they were yoked with a goose yoke made with a shingle with a hole in it in midwinter they were kept in barnyards but the rest of the year they spent the night in the street each flock near the home of its owner it is said that an old goose of each flock always kept awake and stood watch it was told in hadley massachusetts that if a young man chanced to be out late as for instance a cordon his return home wakened the geese throughout the village who sounded the unseasonable hour with a terrible clamor they made so much noise on summer sundays that they seriously disturbed church services and became such nuisances that at last the boys killed the whole flocks goose picking was cruel work three or four times a year were the feathers stripped from the live birds a stocking was pulled over the bird's head to keep it from biting sometimes the head was thrust into a goose basket the pickers had to wear old clothes and tie covers over the hair as the down flew everywhere the quills used for pens were never pulled but once from a goose palladius on husbandry written in the fourth century and englished in the fifteenth century tells of 
goose picking Quote, twice a year deplumed may they be in spring in time and harvest time the old latin and english times for picking were followed in the new world among the dutch geese were everywhere raised for feather beds were if possible more desired by the dutch than the english in a work entitled good order established in pennsylvania and new jersey written by a quaker in sixteen eighty five he urges that schools be provided where the girls could be instructed in quote, the spinning of flax sewing and making all sorts of useful needlework knitting of gloves and stockings making of straw works as hats baskets etc or any other useful art or mystery unquote. it was a century before his quote, making of straw works unquote, was carried out not till larger importation of straw hats and bonnets came to this country when the beautiful and intricate straw bonnets of italian braid genoese leghorn and others were brought here they were too costly for many to purchase and many attempts especially by country-bred girls were made to plait at home straw braids to imitate these envied bonnets many towns claim the first american straw bonnet in fact the attempts were almost simultaneous to betsy metcalf of providence rhode island is usually accorded the honor of starting the straw hat business in america the earliest recorded effort to manufacture straw headwear is shown in a patent given to mrs sibylla masters of philadelphia for using palmetto and straw for hats this mrs masters was the first american man or woman ever awarded a patent in england the first patent issued by the united states to a woman was also for an invention in straw plating a connecticut girl miss sophia woodhouse was given a prize for leghorn hats which she had plated and she took out a patent in eighteen twenty one for a new material for bonnets it was the stalks above the upper joint of spear grass and red top grass growing so profusely in weathersfield from this she had a national reputation and a prize of twenty guineas was given her the same year by the london society of arts the wife of president john quincy adams wore one of these bonnets to the great pride of her husband when the bonnet was braided and sewed into shape it had to be bleached for it was the dark natural straw i don't know the domestic process in general use but an ingenious family of sisters in newburyport thus accomplished their bleaching they bored holes in the head of a barrel tied strings to each new bonnet passed the strings through the holes and carefully plugged the openings with wood they left the bonnets hanging inside the barrel which was set over an old-fashioned foot-stove filled with hot coals on which sulphur had been placed the fumes of the burning sulphur arose and filled the barrel and were closely retained by quilts wrapped around it when the bonnets were taken out they were clear and white the base of a lignum vita mortar made into the proper shape with layers of pasteboard formed the mould on which the bonnet crown was pressed even before they could spin girls were taught to knit as soon as their little hands could hold the needles sometimes girls four years of age could knit stockings boys had to knit their own suspenders all the stockings and mittens for the family and coarse socks and mittens for sale were made in large numbers such fine knitting was done with many intricate and elaborate stitches 
those known as the herringbone and fox and geese were great favorites by the use of curious stitches initials could be knit into mittens and it is said that one young new hampshire girl using fine flaxen yarn knitted the whole alphabet and a verse of poetry into a pair of mittens which i think must have been long arm mitts for ladies wear to have space enough for the poetry to knit a pair of double mittens was a sharp and long day's work nancy peabody's brother of shelburne new hampshire came home one night and said he has lost his mittens while chopping in the woods nancy ran to a bundle of wool in the garret carded and spun a big hank of yarn that night it was soaked and scoured the next morning and in twenty-four hours from the time the brother announced his loss he had a fine new pair of double mittens a pair of double hooked and pegged mittens would last for years pegging i am told was heavy crocheting an elaborate and much admired form of knitting was the bead bags and purses which were so fashionable in the early days of this century though i have seen some knitted bags of colonial days great variety and ingenuity were shown in these bags and purses some bore landscapes and figures others were memorials done in black and white and purple beads having so-called mourning designs such as weeping willows gravestones urns etc with the name of the deceased person and date of death beautiful bags were knitted to match wedding gowns knitted purses were a favorite token and gift from fair hands to husband or lover watch chains were more unusual they were knit in geometrical design were about a yard long and about three-eighths of an inch in diameter one i saw had a, in tiny letters in gilt beads the date and the words remember the giver in all these knitted and crocheted bags the beads had to be strung by a rule in advance in an elaborate pattern of many colors it may easily be seen that the mistake of a single bead in the stringing would spoil the entire design they were therefore never a cheap form of decorative work five dollars was often paid for knitting a single bag a varied group from the collection of mr j howard swift of chicago is here shown netting was another decorative handiwork netted fringes for edging the coverlets curtains testers and valances of high post bedsteads were usually made of cotton thread or twine and when tufted or tasseled were a pretty finish a finer silk or cotton netting was used for trimming sacks and petticoats a letter written by mrs carrington from mount vernon in seventeen ninety nine says of mrs president washington quote, her netting is a source of great amusement to her and is so neatly done that all the younger part of the family are proud of trimming their dresses with it and have furnished me with a whole suit so that i shall appear a la domestique at the first party we have when i get home unquote. knitted purses and work bags also were made similar to the knitted ones a homelier and heavier netting of twine was often done at home for small fishing nets previous to the revolution there was a boarding school kept in philadelphia in second street near walnut by a mrs sarah wilson she thus advertised quote, young ladies may be educated in a genteel manner and pains taken to teach them in regard to their behavior on reasonable terms 
they may be taught all sorts fine needlework viz working on catgut or flowering muslin satin stitch quince stitch ten stitch cross stitch open work tambour embroidering curtains or chairs writing and ciphering likewise waxwork in all its several branches never as yet particularly taught here also how to take profiles in wax to make wax flowers and fruits and pin baskets unquote. there was no limit to the beauty and delicacy of the embroidery of those days i have seen the beautiful needlework cap and skirt worn by governor thomas johnson of maryland when he was christened the coat of arms of both the lux and johnson families the name agnes lux and anne johnson and the words god bless the babe are embroidered upon them in the most delicate fairy stitches the babe grew up to be the governor of his state in revolutionary times in an old book printed in eighteen twenty one a set of rules is given for teaching needlework it is doubtless exactly what had been the method for a century the girls were first shown how to turn a hem on a piece of waste paper then they proceeded to the various stitches in this order to hem to sew and fell a seam to draw threads and hem stitch to gather and to sew on gathers to make buttonholes to sew on buttons to do herringbone stitch to darn to mark to tuck to whip and to sew on a frill there is also a long and tedious set of questions and answers like a catechism explaining the various stitches there was one piece of needlework which was done by every little girl who was carefully brought up she sewed a sampler these were worked in various beautiful and difficult stitches in colored silks and wools on a strong loosely woven canvas in english collections the oblong samplers long and narrow are as a rule older than the square samplers and it is safe to believe the same of american samplers fortunately many of them are dated but this ancient one from the quincy family has no date the oldest sampler i have ever seen is in the collection of antique articles now in pilgrim hall in plymouth it was made by a daughter of the pilgrims the verse embroidered on it reads quote, loria standish is my name lord guide my heart that i may do thy will and fill my hands with such convenient skill as will conduce to virtue void of shame and i will give the glory to thy name Unquote. similar verses and portions of hymns are often found on these samplers a favorite rhyme was quote, when i was young and in my prime you see how well i spent my time and by my sampler you may see what care my parents took of me Unquote. a very spirited verse is quote, you'll mend your life to-morrow still you cry in what far country does to-morrow lie it stays so long is fetched so far i fear twill prove both very old and very dear Unquote strange trees and fruits and birds and beasts wonderful vines and flowers were embroidered on these domestic tapestries in the hands of a skilful worker the sampler might become a thing of beauty and historical interest and the stitches learned and practiced on it might be used on more ambitious pieces of work which often took the shape of the family coat of arms such was the work of mary salter mrs henry quincy 
who was born in 1726 and died in 1755. It is the arms of Salter and Bryan party per pal upon a shield, rich in embossed work in gold and silver thread. It is a beautiful testimonial to the deft and proficient hand of the young needlewoman who embroidered it. Sometimes pretentious pictures representing events in public or family history were embroidered in crewels on sampler linen. The largest and funniest one I have ever seen was the boarding school. Climax of Gloria, Miss Hannah Otis, sister of the Patriot, James Otis. It is a view of the Hancock House, Boston Common, and vicinity as they appeared from 1755 to 1760. Across its expanse, Governor Hancock, rides triumphantly and the fair maid looking over the garden wall at the charles river is dorothy quincy afterwards madam hancock this triumph of schoolgirl affection and needlecraft wholly devoid of perspective or proportion made a great sensation in boston in its day another large piece of similar work is here represented the original is in the library of the american antiquarian society at worcester massachusetts it is a view of the old south church boston with its hoop dames and coach and footmen has a certain value as indicating the costume of the times it is dated seventeen fifty six familiar to the descendants of old new england families are the embroidered mourning pieces these are seldom more than a century old on them weeping willows urns tombs and mourning figures names of departed friends and dates of their deaths and epitaphs were worked with vast skill and were so much admired and were such a delightful home decoration that it is no unusual thing to find these elaborate memento morris with empty space for names and dates waiting for some one to die and still unfilled unfinished blankly commemorative of no one while the industrious embroiderer has long since gone to the tomb she so deftly and eagerly pictured her name too is forgotten tambour work was a favorite form of embroidery in seventeen eighty eight madame hesselius wrote thus in jest of her daughter a philadelphia miss quote, to tambour on crape she has a great passion because here of late it has been much the fashion the shades are distorted the spangles are scattered and for want of due care the crape has got tattered tamboring with various stitches on different kinds of net made pretty laces and these were apparently the laces usually worked and worn in the form of rich veils and collars scores of intricate and beautiful stitches were used and exquisite articles of wear were manufactured a strip of net footing pinned and sewn to paper with reels of fine linen thread and threaded needles attached is shown in the accompanying illustration just as it was left by the deft and industrious hands that have been folded for a century in the dust the pattern and stitches in this design are simple the design was first pricked in outline with a pin then worked in other stitches and patterns none of them the most elaborate and difficult are shown in the infant's cap and collars and the strips of lace and quote, unquote, modesty piece in the seventeenth century lace making with bobbins was taught it is referred to in judge sewell's diary and a friend has shown me the cushion and bobbins used by her far-away grandmother who learned the various stitches in london at a guinea a stitch 
the feminine love of color the longing for decoration as well as pride in skill of needlecraft found riotous expansion in quilt piecing a thrifty economy too a desire to use up all the fragments and bits of stuff which was necessarily cut up in the shaping chiefly of women's and children's garments helped to make the patchwork a satisfaction the amount of labor of careful fitting neat piecing and elaborate quilting the thousands of stitches that went into one of these patchwork quilts are to-day almost painful to regard women reveled in intricate and difficult patchwork they eagerly exchanged patterns with one another they talked over the designs and admired pretty bits of calico and pondered what combinations to make with far more zest than women ever discuss art or examine high art specimens together to-day there was one satisfactory condition in the work and that was the quality of the cottons and linens of which the patchwork was made there were none of the slimsy composition filled aniline dyed calicoes of to-day a piece of cheney patch or copper plate a hundred years old will be as fresh to-day as when woven real india chintzes and palampores are found in these quilts beautiful and artistic stuffs and the firm unyielding high-priced real french calicoes a sense of the idealization of quilt piecing is given also by the quaint descriptive names applied to the various patterns of those the rising sun log cabin job's trouble are perhaps the most familiar job's trouble was simply honeycomb or hexagonal blocks quote, to set a job's trouble unquote, was to cut out a an exact hexagon of a pattern preferably from tin otherwise from firm cardboard to cut out from this many hexagons in stiff brown paper or letter paper these were covered with bits of calico with the edges turned under the sides were sewn carefully together over and over till a firm expanse permitted the removal of the papers the name of the pattern seldom gave an expression of its character dove in the window rob peter to pay paul blue brigade fan mill crow's foot chinese puzzle flywheel love knot sugar bowl are simply whims of fancy floral names such as dutch tulip sunflower rose of sharon bluebells world's rose might suggest a love of flowers sometimes designs are appliqued on with some regard for coloring i once saw a quilt that was a miracle of tedious work the squares of white cotton each held a slender stem with two leaves of green or light brown calico surmounted by a four petal flower of high colored calico pink red blue etc this design was all carefully hemmed down the effect was surprisingly oriental when the patchwork was completed it was laid flatly on the lining often another expanse of patchwork with layers of wool or cotton wadding between and the edges were basted all around four bars of wood about ten feet long the quilting frame were placed at the four edges the quilt was sewed to them with stout thread the bars crossed and tied firmly at corners the whole raised on chairs or tables to a convenient height thus around the outstretched quilt a dozen quilters could sit running the whole together with fanciful set designs of stitching 
when a foot on either side was wholly quilted it was rolled upon its bar and the work went on thus the visible quilt diminished like balzac poe de chagrin in a united and truly sociable work that required no special attention in which all were facing together and all drawing closer together as the afternoon passed in intimate gossip sometimes several quilts were set up i know of a ten days quilting bee in narragansett in seventeen fifty two in early days calicoes were not common but every one had woollen garments and pieces and the quilts made of these were of grateful warmth in bleak new england all kinds of commonplace garments and remnants of decayed gentility were pressed into service in these quilts portions of moth-eaten and discarded uniforms of militiamen worn-out flannel sheets dyed with some brilliant home dye old coat and cloak linings well-worn petticoats a magnificent scarlet cloak worn by a lord mayor of london and brought to america by a member of the merritt family of salisbury massachusetts went through a series of adventures and migrations and ended its days as small bits of vivid color casting a grateful glory and variety on a patchwork quilt in the Saco Valley of Maine. To this day, at venues of sales of old country households in New England, there will be handed out great rolls of woolen pieces to be used for patchwork quilts or rag carpets, and they find purchasers. These woolen quilts had a thin wadding and were usually very closely quilted so they were quite flat they were called quote, press quilts unquote. and an old farm wife said to me in new hampshire quote, girls won't take the trouble to make press quilts nowadays it's as much as they'll do to tack a puff unquote. that is make a light quilt with thick wadding only tacked together from front to back at regular intervals a press quilt which i saw was quilted in inch squares another had a fan pattern with sunflower leaf border another was quilted in the elaborate pattern known as featherwork as much ingenuity was exercised in the design of the quilting as in the pattern of the patchwork and the marking for the quilt design was exceedingly tedious, since, of course, no drawings could be used. I remember seeing one quilt marked by chalking strings, which were stretched tightly across at the desired intervals, and held up and snapped smartly down on the quilt, leaving a faint chalky line to guide the eye and needle. Another simple design was to quilt in rounds, using a saucer or plate to form a perfect circle. The most elaborate quilt I know of is of silk containing portions of the wedding dress of Esther Powell, granddaughter of Gabriel Burden. She was married to James Helm in 1738. When her granddaughter was married in 1795, the quilt was still unfinished, and a woman was hired who worked on it for six months, putting a miracle of fine stitches in the quilting. I think she must have been very old and very slow, for the wages paid her were but twenty cents a week and her keep, which was very small pay even in that day of small wages. When Washington came to Newport, this splendid quilt was sent to grace the bed upon which the hero slept. I said a few summers ago to a farmer's wife who lived on the outskirts of a small New England hill village, quote, Your home is very beautiful. From every window the view is perfect, unquote. 
She answered quickly, quote, Yes, but it's awful lonely for me, for I was born in Worcester. Still, I don't mind as long as we have plenty of quiltings, unquote. In answer to my question, she told me that the previous winter she had, quote, kept count, unquote, and she had helped at twenty-eight regular quiltings, besides her own home patchwork and quilt-making, and much informal help of neighbors on plain quilts. Any one who has attended a county fair, one not too modernized and spoiled, and seen the display of intricate patchwork and quilting, can see that it is not an obsolete accomplishment. A form of decorative work in which many women took great delight and became astonishingly skilled was what was known or at any rate advertised by the ambitious title of papyrotamia it was simply the cutting out of stiff paper of various decorative and ornamental designs with scissors at the time of the revolution it was evidently deemed a very high accomplishment, and the best pieces of work were carefully cherished, mounted on black paper, framed and glazed, and given to friends or bequeathed by will. One old lady is remembered as using her scissors with extraordinary deftness and amusing herself and delighting her friends by occupying the hours of every afternoon visit with cutting out entirely by trained eye various pretty and curious designs, valentines in exceedingly delicate and appropriate patterns, wreaths and baskets of varied flowers marine views religious symbols landscapes all were accomplished coats of arms and escutcheons cut in black paper and mounted on white were highly prized portrait silhouettes were cut out with the aid of a machine which marked and reduced mechanically a sharp shadow cast by the sitter's profile through candle light on a sheet of white paper mrs lydia h sigourney wrote in rhyme of a revered friend of her youth mrs lathrop of a period about a century ago quote, thy dexterous scissors ready to produce the flying squirrel or the long-necked goose or dancing girls with hands together join or tall spruce trees with wreaths of roses twine the well-dressed dolls whose paper form displayed thy penknife's labor and thy pencil's shade unquote. i once found in an old lacquered box in a cupboard a paper packet containing all the cut paper designs mentioned in this rhyme and many more the workmanship of the quote, quote, spruce trees with reeds and roses twine unquote, was specially marvelous. I plainly saw in that design a derivative of the English maypole and encircling reeds. This package was marked with the name of the paper cutter, a revolutionary dame who died at the beginning of this century. Her home was remote from the Norwich home of Mrs. Lathrop, and I know she never visited in Connecticut, yet she had made precisely the same designs, and indeed all the designs. This is but a petty proof among many other more decided ones of the fact that even in those days of scant communication and infrequent and contracted travel there were as in our own times waves of feminine fancy work of attempts at artistic expression which flooded every home and receding left behind much decorative silt of varying but nearly universal uselessness and laborious commonplaceness one of the cut paper landscapes of madame deming a boston lady 
who was a famous papyrotamist, is here shown. It is now owned by James F. Trott, Esquire of Niagara Falls. It is a view of Boston streets just previous to the Revolution. In that handsome volume, the Ten Brook Genealogical Record, are reproductions of some of the landscape views by Albertina Tenbrook at the same date. They show the house and farm surroundings of old Tenbrook Bowery, the ancestral home in New York, and give a wonderful good idea of it. These are not in dead silhouette, for an appearance of shading is afforded by finely cut lines and intervening spaces. The highest form of cut paper reproduction and decoration ever reached was by the Englishwoman Mrs. Delaney, who died in 1788. The friend of the Duchess of Portland and intimate of George the Third and his Queen, she reproduced in colored paper in what she called paper mosaics the entire flora of the United Kingdom and it is said it was impossible at first sight to distinguish these flowers from the real ones. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Home Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morse Earl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dress of the Colonists At the time America was settled, rich dress was almost universal in Europe among persons of any wealth or station the dress of plain people also such as yeomen and small farmers and work people was plentiful and substantial and even peasants had good and ample clothing materials were strongly and honestly made clothing was sewed by hand and lasted long the fashions did not change from year to year, and the rich or stout clothes of one generation were bequeathed by will and worn by a second and even a third and fourth generation. In England, extravagance in dress in court circles and grotesqueness in dress among all educated folk had become abhorrent to that class of persons who were called puritans and as an expression of their dislike they wore plainer garments and cut off their flowing locks and soon were called roundheads the massachusetts settlers who were puritans determined to discourage extravagance in dress in the new world and attempted to control the fashions the massachusetts magistrates were reminded of their duties in this direction by sanctimonious spurring from gentlemen and ministers in england one such meddler wrote to governor winthrop in 1636, quote, Many in your plantations discover too much pride, unquote. Another stern moralist reproved the colonists for writing to England, quote, For cut work, quaffs, for deep stammel dyes, unquote, to be sent to America others prohibited from wearing broad laces were criticized for ordering narrow ones for quote, going as far as they may unquote. in sixteen thirty four the massachusetts general court 
passed restricting sumptuary laws. These laws forbade the purchase of woolen, silk, or linen garments with silver, gold, silk, or thread lace upon them. Two years later, a narrow binding of lace was permitted on linen garments. The colonists were ordered not to make or buy any slashed clothes except those with one slash in each sleeves and another slash on the back. Quote, Cut works, embroid or needle or caps, bands or rails, unquote, and gold or silver girdles, hat bands, belts, ruffs, and beaver hats were forbidden. Liberty was thriftily given, however, to the colonists to wear out any garments they chanced to have unless in the form of inordinately slashed apparel. Immoderate great sleeves and rails and long wings which could not possibly be endured. In 1639, men's attire was approached and scanned and, quote, immoderate great breeches unquote, were tabooed also broad shoulder bands double ruffles and capes and silk roses which latter adornment were worn on the shoes in 1651 the court again expressed its quote, utter detestation that men and women of mean condition, education, and calling should take upon them the garb of gentlemen by wearing of gold or silver lace, or buttons or points at their knees, or walk in great boots, or women of the same rank to wear silk or tiffany hoods or scarves." Unquote many persons were quote, presented unquote, under this law men boot wearers as well as women hood wearers in salem in 1652 a man was presented for quote, excess in boots ribbons gold and silver lace Unquote. In Newbury, in 1653, two women were brought up for wearing silk hoods and scarves, but they were discharged on proof that their husbands were worth two hundred pounds each. In Northampton, in the year 1676, a wholesale attempt was made by the magistrates to abolish, quote, wicked apparel, unquote. Thirty-eight women of the Connecticut Valley were presented at one time for various degrees of finery, and as of too small a state to wear silk. A young girl named Hannah Lyman was presented for, quote, wearing silk in a flaunting manner, in an offensive way and garb, not only before, but when she stood presented." Unquote. Thirty young men were also presented for silk wearing, long hair, and other extravagances. The calm flaunting of her silk in the very eyes of the court by sixteen-year-old Hannah was premonitory of the waning power of the magistrates, for similar prosecutions at a later date were quashed. By 1682 the tables were turned, and we find the court arraigned the selectmen of five towns for not 
prosecuting offenders against these laws as in previous years. In 1675, the town of Dedham had been similarly warned and threatened, but apparently was never prosecuted. Connecticut called to its aid in repressing extravagant dress the economic power of taxation by ordering that whoever wore gold or silver lace, gold or silver buttons, silk ribbons, silk scarves, or bone lace, worth over three shillings a yard, should be taxed as worth a hundred and fifty pounds. Virginia fussed a little over, quote, excess in clothes, unquote. Sir Francis Wyatt, was enjoined not to permit any but the council and the heads of hundreds to wear gold on their clothes or to wear silk till they made it, which was intended more to encourage silk making than to discourage silk wearing, and it provided that unmarried men should be assessed according to their apparel, and married men according to that of their family. In 1660, Virginia colonists were ordered to import no, quote, silk stuff in garments or in pieces except for hoods and scarves, nor silver or gold lace or bone lace or silk or threads, nor ribbons wrought with gold or silver in them, unquote. The ministers did not fail in their duty in attempting to march with the magistrates in the restriction and simplification of dress. They preached often against, quote, intolerable pride in clothes and hair, unquote. Even when the pilgrims were in Holland, the preachers had been deeply disturbed over the dress of their minister's wife. Madam Johnson, who wore, quote, lawn coives, unquote, and busks, and a velvet hood, and, quote, whalebones in her petticoat bodice, unquote, and worst of all, quote, a topish hat, unquote. One of the earliest interferences of Roger Williams was when he instructed the women of Salem Parish to wear veils in public. But John Cotton preached to them the next Sunday, and he proved to the dames and good wives that veils were a sign and symbol of undue subjection to their husbands, and Salem women soon proved their rights by coming barefaced to meeting. Mr. Davenport, preached about men's headgear that men must take off their hats and stand up at the announcement of the text and if new haven men wore their hats in meeting i can't see why they fuss so over quakers broad brims after a while the whole church interfered in seventeen sixty nine the church at andover put it to a vote whether Quote, the parish disapprove of the female sex sitting with their hats on in the meeting house in time of divine service as being indecent. Unquote. In the town of Abington in 1775, it was voted that it was, quote, an indecent way that the female sex do sit with their hats and bonnets on to worship God, unquote. Still another town voted that it was the, quote, town's mind, unquote, that the women should take their bonnets off in meeting and hang them, quote, on the pegs, unquote. We do not know positively, but I suspect that the bonnets continued to grace the heads instead of the pegs in Andover, Abington, and other towns. To know how the colonists were dressed, we have to learn from the lists of their clothing, which they left by will, 
which lists are still preserved in court records from the inventories of the garments furnished to each settler who came by contract from the orders sent back to england for new clothing from a few crude portraits and from some articles of ancient clothing which are still preserved when salem was settled the massachusetts bay company furnished clothes to all the men who immigrated and settled that town every man had four pairs of shoes four pairs of stockings a pair of norwich garters four shirts two suits of doublet and hose of leather lined with oilskin a woolen suit lined with leather four bands two handkerchiefs a green cotton waistcoat a leather belt a woolen cap a black hat two red-knit caps two pairs of gloves a mandillion or cloak lined with cotton and an extra pair of breeches little boys just as soon as they could walk wore clothes made precisely like their fathers doublets which were double jackets leather knee breeches leather belts knit caps the outfit for the virginia planters was not so liberal for the company was not so wealthy it was called quote, particular of apparel unquote. it had only three bands three pairs of stockings and three shirts instead of four the suits were of canvas frieze and cloth the clothing was doubtless lighter because the climate of virginia was warmer there were no gloves no handkerchiefs no hat no red knit caps no mandillion no extra pair of breeches they had quote, a dozen points unquote, which are simply tapes to hold up the clothing and fasten it together the clothing of the piscataqua planters varied but little from the others they had scarlet waistcoats and cassocks of cloth not of leather we are apt to think of the puritan settlers of new england as sombre in attire wearing quote, sad colored unquote, garments but green and scarlet waistcoats and scarlet caps certainly afforded a gay touch of color a young boy about ten years old named john livingston was sent from new york to school in new england at the latter part of the seventeenth century and quote, account of his new linen and clothes unquote, has been preserved and it gives an excellent idea of the clothing of a son of wealthy people at that time it reads thus in the old spelling quote, eleven new shirts four pair lace sleeves eight plain cravats four cravats with lace four striped waistcoats with black buttons one flowered waistcoat four new ossenburg breeches one gray hat with a black ribbon one gray hat with a blue ribbon one dozen black buttons one dozen colored buttons three pair gold buttons three pair silver buttons two pair fine blue stockings one pair fine red stockings four white handkerchiefs two speckled handkerchiefs five pair gloves one stuffed coat with black buttons one cloth coat one pair blue plush breeches one pair serge breeches two combs one pair new shoes silk and thread to mend his clothes ossenbrig was a heavy strong linen this would seem to be a summer outfit and scarcely warm enough for new england winters other schoolboys at that date had deerskin breeches leather was much used especially in the form of tanned buckskin breeches and deerskin hunters jackets 
which have always and deservedly been a favorite wear, since they are one of the most appropriate, useful, comfortable, and picturesque garments ever worn by men in any active outdoor life. Soon, in the larger cities and among wealthy folk, a much more elaborate and varied style of dress became fashionable. The dress of little girls in families of wealth was certainly almost as formal and elegant as the dress of their mamas, and it was a very hampering and stiff dress. They wore vast hoop petticoats, heavy stays, and high-heeled shoes. Their complexions were objects of special care. They wore masks of cloth or velvet to protect them from the tanning rays of the sun and long-armed gloves. Little Dolly Payne, who afterwards became the wife of President Madison, went to school wearing a white linen mask to keep every ray of sunshine from the complexion a sunbonnet sewed on her head every morning by her careful mother and long gloves covering the hands and arms our present love of outdoor life of athletic sports and our indifference to being sunburned makes such painstaking vanity seem most unbearably tiresome in seventeen thirty seven Colonel John Lewis sent from Virginia to England for a wardrobe for a young miss, a schoolgirl who was his ward. The list read thus, quote, A cape ruffle and tucker, the lace five shillings a yard, one pair white stays, eight pairs white kid gloves, two pair colored kid gloves, two pair worsted hose, three pair thread hose, one pair silk shoes laced, one pair morocco shoes, one hoop coat, one hat, four pair plain Spanish shoes, two pair calf shoes, one mask, one fan, one necklace, one girdle and buckle, one piece fashionable calico, four yards ribbon for knots, one and a half yard cambric, a mantua and coat of lute string, unquote. In the middle of the century, George Washington also sent to England for an outfit for his stepdaughter, Miss Custis. She was four years old, and he ordered for her pack-thread stays, stiff coats of silk, masks, caps, bonnets, bibs, ruffles, necklaces, fans, silk and calamanco shoes, and leather pumps. There were also eight pairs of kid mitts and four pairs of gloves. These, with the masks, show that this little girl's complexion was also to be well guarded. A little New England Miss Huntington, when twelve years old, was sent from Norwich, Connecticut, to be, quote, finished, unquote, in a Boston boarding school. She had twelve silk gowns, but her teacher wrote home that she must have another gown of, quote, a recently imported rich fabric, unquote which was at once bought for her because it was, quote, suitable for her rank and station, unquote. Through the 17th and 18th century, there was a constant succession of rich and gay fashions, for American dress was carefully modeled upon European, especially English modes. Men's wear was as rich as women's, an English traveler said that Boston women and men in 1740 dressed as gay every day as courtiers in England at a coronation. But with all the richness, there was no wastefulness. The sister of the rich Boston merchant, Peter 
Faneuil, who built Faneuil Hall, sent her gowns to London to be turned and dyed, and her old ribbons and gowns to be sold. But her gowns, which are still preserved, are of magnificent stuffs. New Yorkers were dressed in gauzes, silks, and laces. Even women Quakers in Pennsylvania had to be warned against wearing hoop petticoats, scarlet shoes, and puffed and rolled hair. The family of so frugal a man as Benjamin Franklin did not escape a slight infection of the prevailing love for gay dress. In the Pennsylvania Gazette, this advertisement appeared in 1750. Quote, Whereas on Saturday night last the house of Benjamin Franklin of this city, printer, was broken open, and the following things feloniously taken away, viz., a double necklace of gold beads, a woman's scarlet cloak almost new, with a double cape, a woman's gown of printed cotton of the sort called brocade print, very remarkable, the ground dark with large red roses, and other large and yellow flowers, with blue in some of the flowers, with many green leaves, a pair of woman's stays covered with white tabby before, and dove-colored tabby behind, with two large steel hooks, and sundry other goods, etc., unquote. Southern dames, especially of Annapolis, Baltimore, and Charleston, were said to have the richest brocades and damasks that could be bought in London. Every sailing vessel that came from Europe brought boxes of splendid clothing. The heroes of the Revolution had a high regard for dress. The patriot John Hancock was seen at noonday wearing a scarlet velvet cap, a blue damask gown lined with velvet, white satin embroidered waistcoat, black satin small clothes, white silk stockings, red morocco slippers. George Washington was most precise in his orders for his clothing and wore the richest silk and velvet suits. A true description of a Boston printer just after the Revolution shows his style of dress. He wore a pea-green coat, white vest, nankin, small clothes, white silk stockings and pumps, fastened with silver buckles which covered at least half the foot from instep to toe. His small clothes were tied at the knees with ribbon of the same color in double bows, the ends reaching down to the ankles. His hair in front was well loaded with pomatum, frizzled or craped and powdered, Behind his natural hair was augmented by the audition of a large queue, called vulgarly a false tail, which enrolled in some yards of black ribbon hung halfway down his back. Unquote. Many letters still exist written by prominent citizens of colonial times ordering clothing chiefly from Europe. Rich laces, silk materials, velvet, and fine cloth of light and gay colors abound. Frequently they ordered nightgowns of silk and damask. These nightgowns were not a garment worn at night, but a sort of dressing gown. Harvard students were, in 1754, forbidden to wear them. Under the name of Banyan, they became very fashionable, and men had their portraits painted in them. For instance, the portrait of Nicholas Bolston, now in Harvard Memorial Hall. With the increase of trade with China, many Chinese and East Indian goods became fashionable, with hundreds of different names. A few were of silk or linen, but far more of cotton. Among them, nankeens were the most important, and even for winter wear. 
both men and women wore for many years great cloaks or capes known by various names such as rocolors capuchins polices etc women's shoes were of very thin materials and paper soled they wore to protect these frail shoes when walking on the ill-paved streets various forms of overshoes known as galoshoes, shoes clogs patent etc when riding women in the colonies wore as did queen elizabeth a safeguard a long over petticoat to protect the gown from mud and rain this was sometimes called a foot mantle also a weather skirt a traveller tells of seeing a row of horses tied to a fence outside a quaker meeting some carried side saddles some men's saddles and pillions on the fence hung the muddy safeguards the Quaker dames had worn outside their drab petticoats. Men wore sherry valleys or spatter dashes to protect their gay breeches. There was one fashion which lasted for a century and a half, which was so untidy, so uncomfortable, so costly, and so ridiculous, that we can only wonder that it was endured for a single season. I mean the fashion of wig-wearing by men. The first colonists wore their own natural hair. The cavaliers had long and perfumed love-locks, and though the Puritans had been called roundheads, their hair waved also over the band or collar, and often hung over the shoulder. The Quakers also wore long locks, as a lovely portrait of William Penn shows but by 1675 wigs had become common enough to be denounced by the Massachusetts government and to be preached against by many ministers, while other ministers proudly wore them. Wigs were called horrid bushes of vanity and hundreds of other disparaging names which seemed to make them more popular. They varied from year to year, Sometimes they swelled out at the sides, or rose in great puffs, or turned under in heavy rolls, or hung in braids and curls and pigtails. They were made of human hair, of horse hair, goat's hair, calves and cow's tails, of thread, silk, and mohair. They had scores of silly and meaningless names, such as grave full bottom giddy feather top long tail fox tail drop wig etc they were bound and braided with pink green red and purple ribbons sometimes all these colors on one wig they were very heavy and very hot and very expensive often costing what would be equal to a hundred dollars today the care of them was a great item, often ten pounds a year for a single wig, and some gentlemen owned eight or ten wigs. Little children wore them. I have seen the bill for a wig for William Freeman, dated 1754. He was a child seven years old. His father paid nine pounds for it, and the same for wigs for his other boys of nine and ten. Even servants wore them. I read in the Massachusetts Gazette of a runaway negro slave who, quote, wore off a curl of hair, tied it round his head with a string to imitate a wig, unquote, which must have been a comical sight. After wigs had become unfashionable, the natural hair was powdered, and was tied in a queue in the back. This was an untidy, troublesome fashion which ruined the clothes, for the hair was soaked with oil or pomatum to make the powder stick. Comparatively little jewelry was worn. A few men had gold or silver sleeve buttons. A few women had bracelets or lockets. 
nearly all of any social standing had rings which were chiefly mourning rings as these gloomy ornaments were given to all the chief mourners at funerals it can be seen that a man of large family connections or a prominent social standing might acquire a great many of them the minister and doctor usually had a ring at every funeral they attended it is told of an old salem doctor who died in seventeen fifty eight that he had a tankard full of mourning rings that he had secured at funerals men sometimes wore thumb rings which seems no queerer than the fact that they carried muffs old dr prince of boston carried an enormous bearskin muff gloves also were gifts at funerals sometimes in large numbers at the funeral of the wife of governor belcher in seventeen thirty eight over a thousand pairs were given away rev andrew elliot was the pastor of the north church in boston had twenty nine hundred pair of gloves given him in thirty two years many of these he sold in all the colonies whether settled by dutch english french german or swedes gloves were universally given at funerals early watches were clumsy affairs often globose in shape with a detached outer case to show how few of the first colonists owned either watches or clocks we have the contemporary evidence of roger williams when he rode thirty miles down the bay and disputed with the foxians at newport in sixteen seventy two it was agreed that each party would be heard in turn for a quarter of an hour but no clock was available in newport and among the whole population that flocked to the debate there was not a single watch williams says quote, unless we had clocks and watches and quarter glasses as in some ships it was impossible to be exactly punctual unquote. so they guessed at the time sundials were often set in the street in front of houses and noon marks on the threshold of the front door or window sill helped to show the hour of the day End of chapter 12chapter 13 of home life in colonial days by alice morse earl this librivox recording is in the public domain jackknife industries chepa rose was one of those old-time chap men known throughout new england as quote, trunk peddlers unquote. bearing on his back by means of a harness of stout hempen webbing two oblong trunks of thin metal probably tin for forty-eight years he had appeared at every considerable farmhouse throughout narragansett and eastern connecticut at intervals as regular as the action and appearance of the sun moon and tides and everywhere was he greeted with an eager welcome chepa was as he said quote, half injun half french and half yankee unquote. from his indian half 
he had his love of tramping which made him choose the wandering trade of trunk peddler his french half made him a good trader and talker while his yankee half endowed him with a universal yankee trait a quote, handiness unquote, which showed in scores of gifts and accomplishments and knacks that made him as warmly greeted everywhere as were his attractive trunks he was a famous medicine brewer from the roots and herbs and barks that he gathered as he tramped along the country roads he manufactured a cough medicine that was twice as effective and twice as bitter as old dr green's he made famous plasters of two kinds plasters to stick and plasters to crawl the latter to follow the course of the disease or pain he concocted wonderful ink he showed jenny green how to bleach her new straw bonnet with sulphur fumes he mended umbrellas harnesses and tinware he made glorious teetotums which the children looked for as eagerly and unfailingly as they did for his tops and marbles his ribbons and gibraltars one day he came to the woods to john helm's house carrying in his hand a stout birchen staff or small tree trunk which he laid down on the flat millstone embedded in the grass at the back door while he displayed and sold his wares and had his dinner he then went out to the dooryard with little johnny helm sat down on the millstone lighted his pipe opened his jackknife and discoursed thus quote, johnny i'm going to tell you how to make an injun broom first you must find a big birch tree there ain't so many big ones now of any kind as there used to be when we made canoes and plates and cradles and water spouts and troughs and furniture out of the bark but you must get a yellow birch tree as straight as h and exactly five inch across now how can you tell how fur it is across a tree afore you cut it off i can tell you by the light of my eye but that's injun learning let me tell you by book learning measure it around and make the string in three parts one part'll be what it is across if it's nine inches round it'll be three inch across and so on now don't you forget that wow you must get a straight birch tree five inch across where you cut it off just like this one then make the stick five foot long then one foot and two inch from the big end cut a ring round the bark well say two inch wide just like this then you take off all the bark below that ring then you begin a slivering with a sharp jackknife little teeny flat slivers way up to the bark ring when it's all slivered up thin and flat there'll be a little hard core left inside at the top and you must cut it out careful then you take off the bark above the ring 
and begin slivering down. Leave a stick just big enough for a handle. Then tie this last lot of slivers down tight over the others with a hard twisted toe string and trim em off even. Then whittle off and scrape off a good smooth handle with a hole in the top to put a loop of cowhide in to hang it up by orderly. Yes, Johnny, I've got just enough injun in me to make a good broom, not enough to be ashamed of and not enough to be proud of. But you mustn't forget this. A moccasin's the best cover a man ever had on his feet in the woods. The easiest to get stuff for, the easiest to make, the easiest to wear. And a birch bark canoe's the best boat a man can have on the river. It's the easiest to get stuff for, easiest to carry, the fastest to paddle and a snowshoe's the best help a man can have in winter. It's the easiest to get stuff for, the easiest to walk on, the easiest to carry. And just so a birch broom is the best broom a man, or at any rate a woman, can have. Four best things, and all of them is injun. Now you just slip in and take that broom to Phyllis. I see her the last time I was here a using a miserable store broom to clean her oven, and just ask her if I can't have a mug of Applejack afore I go to bed." Unquote. If this scene had been laid in New Hampshire or Vermont instead of Narragansett, the Indian broom would have been no novelty to any boy or house servant, or in the northern New England states, heavily wooded with yellow birch. Every boy knew how to make Indian brooms, and every household in country or town had them. There was a constant demand in Boston for them, and sometimes country stores had several hundred of the brooms at a time. Throughout Vermont, seventy years ago, the uniform price paid for making one of these brooms was six cents, and if the splints were very fine and the handle scraped with glass, it took nearly three evenings to finish it. Indian squaws peddled them throughout the country for nine pence apiece. Major Robert Randolph told in fashionable London circles about the year 1750 that when he was a boy in New Hampshire, he earned his only spending money by making these brooms and carrying them on his back ten miles to town to sell them. Girls could whittle as well as boys, and often exchanged the birch brooms they made for a bit of ribbon or lace. A simpler and less durable broom was made of hemlock branches. A local rhyme says of them, quote, Driving at twilight the waiting cows, with arms full laden with hemlock boughs, to be traced on a broom ere the coming day from its eastern chambers should dance away." Unquote. The hemlock broom was simply a bunch of close-growing, full-foliage hemlock branches tied tightly together and wound around with hempen twine, traced, quote-unquote, the rhyme says, with a sharp-pointed handle, which the boys had shaped and whittled, driven well into the bound portion. This making of brooms for domestic use is but an example of one of the many scores of useful domestic 
and farm articles which were furnished by the natural resources of every woodlot adapted by the yankee jackknife and a few equally simple tools of which the gimlet might take the second place it was so emphatically a wooden age in colonial days that it seemed almost that there were no hard metal used for any articles which to-day seem so necessarily of metal ploughs were of wood and harrows cartwheels were often wholly of wood without tires though sometimes iron plates called strakes held the fellows together B, that's f e l l o e s being fastened to them by long clinch pins the dish turner and cooper were artisans of importance in those days piggins noggins runlets keelers firkins buckets churns dye tubs cowls powdering tubs were made of cherry or no use of metal the forests were the wealth of the colonies in more ways than one and it may be said that they furnished both domestic winter employment and toys for the boys the new england forests were full of richly varied kinds of wood suitable for varied uses with varied qualities pliability stiffness durability weight strength and it is surprising to see how quickly the woods were assigned to fixed uses even for toys in every state pop guns were made from elder bows and arrows of hemlock whistles of chestnut or willow the rev john pierpont wrote thus of the whittling of his childhood days quote, the yankee boy before he sent to school well knows the mysteries of that magic tool the pocket knife to that his wistful eye turns while he hears his mother's lullaby and in the education of the lad no little part that implement hath had his pocket knife to the young whittler brings a growing knowledge of material things projectiles music and the sculptor's art his chestnut whistle and his shingle dart his elder pop-gun with its hickory rod its sharp explosion and rebounding wad his cornstalk fiddle and the deeper tone the murmurs from his pumpkin leaf trombone conspire to teach the boy to these succeed his bow his arrow of a feathered reed his windmill raised the passing breeze to win his water wheel that turns upon a pin thus by genius and his jackknife driven ere long he'll solve you any problem given make you a locomotive or a clock cut a canal or build a floating dock make anything in short for sea or shore from a child's rattle to a seventy-four make it said i ay when he undertakes it he'll make the thing and make the thing that makes it Unquote. the boy's jackknife was a possession so highly desired so closely treasured in those days when boys had so few belongings that it is pathetic to read of many a farm lad's struggles and long hours of weary work 
to obtain a good knife. Barlow knives were the most highly prized for certainly sixty years, and had, I am told, a vast popularity for over a century. May they forever rest in glorious memory, as they live the happiest of lots. To be the best love of a century of Yankee boys is indeed an enviable destiny. A few battered old soldiers of this vast army of Barlow jackknives still linger to show us the homely features borne by the centuries well beloved. The Smithsonian Institute cherishes some of colonial days, and from Deerfield Memorial Hall are shown three Barlow knives whose picture should appear in every American something more than the presentment of dull bits of wood and rusted metal. These Yankee jackknives were, said Daniel Webster, the direct forerunners of the cotton gin and thousands of noble American inventions. The New England boy's whittling was his alphabet of mechanics. In this connection, let us note the skillful and utilitarian adaptation not only of natural materials for domestic and farm use, but also natural forms. The farmer and his wife both turned to nature for implements and utensils, or for parts adapted to shape readily into implements and utensils, of everyday life. When we read of the first Boston settlers that the dainty Indian maize was eat with clam shells out of wooden trays, we learn of a primitive spoon, a clam shell set in a split stick which has been used till this century. Large, flat clamshells were used and highly esteemed by housewives as skimming shells in the dairy to skim cream from the milk. Gourd shells made capital bowls, skimmers, dippers, and bottles, pumpkin shells, good seed and grain holders, turkey wings made an ever-ready hearth brush. In the forest were many, quote, crooked sticks, unquote, that were more useful than any straight ones could be. When the mower wanted a new snaith, or sneed, as he called it, for his sith, he found in the woods a deformed sapling that had grown under a log or twisted around a rock in a double bend, which made it the exact shape desired. He then whittled it, dressed it with a draw shave, fastened the nibs with a nib wedge, hung it with an iron ring, and was ready for the mowing field. Sled runners were made from saplings bent at the root. The best stills for a cart were those naturally shaped by growth. The curved pieces of wood in the harness of a draft horse, called the hams, to which the traces are fastened, could be found in twisted growths, as could also portions of ox yokes. The gambrels used in slaughtering times, hay hooks, long handled pot hooks for brick ovens, could all be cut ready shaped. The smaller underbrush and saplings had many uses. Sled and cart stakes were cut from some, long bean poles from others. Specially straight clean sticks were saved for whip stalks. Sections of birch bark could be bottomed and served for baskets. 
or potash cans, while capital feed boxes could be made in the same way of sections cut from a hollow hemlock. Elm rind and portions of brown ash butts were natural materials for chair seats and baskets, as were flags for doormats. Forked branches made geese and hog yokes. Hogs that ran at large had to wear yokes. It was ordered that these yokes should measure as long as twice and a half times the depth of the neck, while the bottom piece was three times the width of the neck. In the shaping of heavy and large vessels, such as salt mortars, pig troughs, maple sap troughs, the jackknife was abandoned and the methods of the Indians adopted. These vessels were burnt and scraped out of a single log, and thus had a weighty stability and permanence. Wooden bread troughs were also made from a single piece of wood. These were oblong, trench-shaped bowls about 18 inches long across the trough ran lengthwise a stick or rod on which rested the sieve, circe or temsi. When flour was sifted into the trough, the saying, quote, set the Thames or Thamesy on fire, unquote, meant that hard work and active friction would set the wooden Thamesy on fire. Sometimes the mold of an oxbow was dug out of a log of wood. Oftener a plank of wood was cut into the desired shape as a frame or mold and fastened to a heavy backboard. The oxbow was steamed, placed in the bow mold, pinned in, and then carefully seasoned. The boys whittled cheese ladders, cheese hoops, and red cherry butter paddles for their mother's dairy, also many parts of cheese presses and churns. To the toys enumerated by Reverend Mr. Pierpont, they added box traps and figure four traps of varied sizes for catching very sized animals. Many farm implements, other than those already named, were made, and many portions of tools and implements. Among them were shovels, swingling knives, sled neeps, stanchions, handles for spades, and bill hooks, rake stales, fork stales, flails, a group of old farm implements from Memorial Hall at Deerfield is given here. The handleless Sith snaith is said to have come over on the Mayflower. The making of flails was an important and useful work. Many were broken and worn out during a th great threshing. Both parts, the staff or handle, and the swingle or swipple, were carefully shaped from well-chosen wood to be joined together later by an eel-skin or leather strap. The flail is little seen on farms today. Threshing and winnowing machines have taken its place. The father of Robert Burns declared threshing with a flail to be the only degrading and stultifying work on a farm but I never knew another farmer who deemed it so, though it was certainly hard work. Last autumn I visited the, quote, poor farm, unquote, on Quonset Point in old Narragansett. In the vast barn of that beautiful and sparsely occupied country home, two powerful men, 
picturesque in blue jeans tucked in heavy boots, in scarlet shirts and great straw hats, were threshing out grain with flails. Both men were blind, one wholly, the other partially so, and were, quote, town poor, unquote. Their strong bare arms swung the long flails in alternate strokes with the precision of clockwork, bringing each blow down on the piled-up wheat straw which covered the barn floor as they advanced, one stepping backward while the other stepped forward, and then receded with mechanical and rhythmic regularity, a step and a blow, from one end of the long barn to the other the half-blind thresher could see the outline of the open door against the sunlight and his steps and voice guided his sightless fellow worker thus healthful and useful employment was given to two stricken waifs through the use of primitive methods which no modern machine could ever have afforded and the blue sky and bay with autumnal sunshine on the piled-up golden wheat on the floor and in rack idealized and even made of the threshers paupers though they were a beautiful picture of old-time farm life wood for axe helves was carefully chosen sawed split and whittled into shape these were then scraped as smooth as ivory with broken glass some man had a knack that was almost genius in shaping these axe helves and selecting the wood for them in a country where the broad axe was so important an implement used every day by every farmer where lumbermen and loggers and shipwrights swung the axe the entire day for many months men were ready to pay double price for a well-made helve so shaped as to let the heavy blow jar as little as possible the hand holding the helve one main farmer boasted that he had made and sold five hundred axe helves and received a good price for them all that some had gone five hundred miles out west others a hundred miles up country and of no one of them which he had set had it ever been said as of the axe in deuteronomy quote, when a man goeth into the wood to you wood and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down a tree then the head slippeth from the helve unquote. a little money might be earned by cutting heel pegs for shoemakers these were made of a maple trunk sawed across the grain making the circular board thin enough a half inch or so for the correct length of the pegs the end was then marked in parallel lines then grooved across at right angles then split as marked into pegs with knife and mallet a story is told of a farmer named meigs who on the winter ride to market in company with a score or more of his neighbors stole out at night from the tavern fireside where all were gathered to the barn where the horses were put up there he took an oat bag out of a neighbor's sleigh and poured out a good feed for his own horse in the morning it was found that his horse had not relished the shoe pegs that had been put in his manger and their tell-tale presence plainly pointed out the thief these shoe pegs were a venture of two farmer's boys which their father was taking to town to sell for them and in indignation the boys thrust on the thief the name of shoe pegs megs which he carried to the end of his life 
when the boys had learned to use a few other tools besides their jackknives as they quickly did they could get sawed staves from sawmills and make up shooks of staves bound with hoops of red oak for molasses hogheads these would be shipped to the west indies and form an important link in the profitable rum and slave round of traffic that bound africa new england and the west indies so closely together in those days a constant occupation for men and boys was making reeved or shaved shingles they were split with a beetle and wedge a smart workman could buy sharp work make a thousand a day there may still be occasionally found in what were well wooded pine regions in shed or barn lofts or in old wood houses a stout oaken frame or rack such as was at one time found in nearly every house it was known as a bundling mold or shingling mold at the bottom of this strong frame were laid straight sticks and twisted widths which extended up the sides upon these were evenly packed the shingles two hundred and fifty in number known as a quarter with widths or binders which twisted strongly around when the number was full the mold held them firmly in place while being tied these were sealed by law and shipped colors of staves were regularly appointed town officers the dimensions of the shingles were given by law and rule fifteen inches was the length for one period of time and the bundling mold conformed to it daniel leek of salisbury new hampshire made during his lifetime and was paid for a million shingles during the years he was accomplishing this colossal work he cleared three hundred acres of land tapped for twenty years at least six hundred maple trees making sometimes four thousand pounds of sugar a year he could mow six acres a day giving nine tons of hay his strong long arms cut a swath twelve feet wide in his spare time he worked as a cooper and he was a famous drum maker truly there were giants in those days i love to read of such vigorous powerful lives they seem to be of a race entirely different from our own still among our new england forebears i doubt not many of us had some such giants who conquered for us the earth and forests one mark the shingling industry left on the household in the sawing of blocks there would always be some too knotty or gnarled to split into shingles these were what were known in the vernacular as unmarginable shingle bolts they formed in many a pioneer's home and in many a pioneer schoolhouse good solid seats for children and even grown people to sit on and even in pioneer meeting-houses these blocks could sometimes be seen other fittings for the house were whittled out long heavy wooden hinges were cut from hornbeam for cupboard and closet doors even shed doors were hung on wooden hinges as were house doors in the earliest colonial days door latches were made of wood also oblong buttons to fasten chamber and cupboard doors new england housekeepers prized the smooth close-grained bowls which the indians made from the veined and mottled knots of maple wood they were valued at what seems high prices for wooden utensils and were often named and bequeathed in wills 
Maple wood has been used and esteemed by many nations for cups and bowls. The old English and German vessel known as a mazer was made of maple wood, often bound and tipped with silver. Spencer speaks in his shepherd's calendar of a mazer wrought of maple wood. A well-known specimen in England bears the legend in Gothic text, quote, In the name of the Trinity, fill the cup and drink to me, unquote. Sometimes a specially skillful Yankee would rival the Indians in shaping and whittling out these bowls. I have seen two really beautiful ones carved with double initials, and one with a scriptural reference said to be the work of a lover for his bride. Another token of affection and skill from the whittler were carved busks, which were broad and strong strips of wood placed in corsets or stays to help to form and preserve the long-waisted stiff figure then fashionable. One carved busk bears initials and an appropriately sentimental design of arrows and hearts. On the rim of spinning wheels or shuttles, Swift and on ninny noddies or hand reels, I have seen lettering by the hands of rustic lovers. A finely carved legend on a hand reel reads, Polly Green, her reel, count your threads right if you reel in the night when I am far away. June 1777 Perhaps some revolutionary soldier gave this as a parting gift to his sweetheart on the eve of battle. On his powder horn the rustic carver bestowed his best and daintiest work, emblem both of war and of sport. It seemed worthy of being shaped into the highest expression of his artistic longing. A chapter, even a book, might be filled with the romantic history and representations of American powder horns. Patriotism, sentiment, and adventure shed equal halos over them. Months of the patient work of every spare moment was spent in beautifying them, and their quaintness, variety, and individuality are a never-ceasing delight to the antiquary. Maps, plans, legends, verses, portraits, landscapes, family history, crests, dates of birth, marriages, and deaths, lists of battles, patriotic and religious sentiments, all may be found on powder horns. They have in many cases proved valuable historical records and have sometimes been the only records of events. Mr. Rufus A. Gritter of Canajahari has many colored drawings of about 500 of these powder horns and of canteens or drinking horns. It is unfortunate that the ordinary processes of book illustration give too scant suggestion of the variety, beauty, and delicacy of their decoration to permit the reproduction of some of these powder horns in these pages. These habits of employing the spare moments of farm life in the manufacture of wood or farm implements and various aids to domestic comfort were not peculiar to New England farmers, nor invented by them. The old English farmer author Thomas Tusser, in his rhymed book, Five Hundred Points of Good Husbandry, written in the sixteenth century, which Southey declared to be one of the most curious and formerly one of the most popular books in our language, was careful to give instructions in his remembrances and doings as to similar industries on the English farm and manor house. He says, quote, 
yokes forks and such other let bailey spy out and gather the same as he walketh about and after at leisure let this be his hire to beat them and trim them at home by the fire to beat that's b e a t h is to heat unseasoned wood to harden and straighten it Quote, if hop yard or orchard you mean for to have for hop poles and crotches in loping go save save elm ash and crab tree for cart and for plow save step for a steel of the crotch of a bough save hazel for fork save sallow for rake save halver and thorn thereof flails for to make unquote. the massachusetts bay settlers came chiefly from the vicinity many from the same county where tusser lived and farmed and where his points of good husbandry were household words so they had in their english homes as had their grandfathers before them the knowledge and habits of saving and utilizing the various woods on the farm and of occupying every spare minute with the useful jackknife the varied and bountiful trees of the new world stimulated and emphasized the whittling habit until it became universally accepted as a distinguishing new england characteristic a yankee trait this constant employment of every moment of the waking hours contributed to impart to New Englanders a regard and method of life which is spoken of by many outsiders with contempt, namely, a closely girded and invariable habit of economy. Children brought up in this way knew the value of everything in the household knew the time it took to produce it for they had labored themselves and they grew to take care of small things not to squander and waste what they had been so long at work on this instead of being a thing to sneer at is one of the very best elements in a community one of the best securities of character for sudden leaps of fortune are given to but few and are seldom lasting and the result of sudden inflations are more disastrous even to a community than to isolated individuals as may be abundantly proved by the earlier history of virginia it was not meanness that made the wiry new england farmer so cautious and exacting in trade when the pennies he saved sent his son through college. It was not meanness which made him refuse to spend money. He had no money to spend, and it was a high sense of honor that kept him from running in debt. It was not meanness which so justly ordered conditions and cared for the unfortunate that even in those days of horrible drunkenness often there would not be a pauper in the entire village it has been a reproach that in some towns the few town poor were venued out to be cared for the mode was harsh in its wording and unfeeling in method but in reality the pauper found a home i have known cases where the pauper was not only supported but cherished in the families to whose lot she fell. End of chapter 13this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Travel, Transportation, and Taverns 
wherever the earliest colonists settled in america they had to adopt the modes of travel and the ways of getting from place to place of their predecessors and new neighbors the indians these were first and generally to walk on their own stout legs second to go wherever they could by water in boats in maryland and virginia where for a long time nearly all settlers tried to build their homes on the banks of the rivers and bays the travel was almost entirely by boats as it was between settlements on all the great rivers the hudson connecticut and merrimack between the large settlements in massachusetts boston salem and plymouth travel was preferably when the weather permitted in boats the colonists went in canoes or pinnaces shaped and made exactly like the birch bark canoes of the canadian indians today and in dugouts which were formed from hollowed pine logs usually about twenty feet long and two or three feet wide both of these were made for them by the indians it was said that one indian working alone felling the pine tree by the primitive way of burning and scraping off the charred parts with a stone tool called a celt for the indians had no iron or steel axes then cutting off the top in the same manner then burning out part of the interior then burning and scraping and shaping it without and within could make one of these dugouts in three weeks the indians at odonaga still make the wooden mortars they use in the same tedious way when the white men came to america in great ships the indians marveled much at the size thinking they were hollowed out tree trunks as were the dugouts and wondered where such vast trees grew the swedish scientific traveller calm who was in america in seventeen forty eight was delighted with the indian canoes and dugouts he found the swede settlers using them constantly to go long distances to market he said quote, they usually carry six persons who however by no means must be unruly but sit at the bottom of the canoe in the quietest manner possible lest the boat upset they are narrow round below have no keel and may be easily overset so when the wind is brisk the people make for the land larger dugouts were made for war canoes which would carry thirty or forty savages unquote. these boats usually kept close to the shore both in calm and windy weather though the natives were not afraid to go many miles out to sea in the dugouts the lightness of the birch bark canoe made it specially desirable where there were such frequent overland transfers it was and is a beautiful and perfect expression of natural and wild life as longfellow wrote quote, 
the forest life was in it all its mystery and magic all the lightness of the birch tree all the toughness of the cedar all the larches supple sinews and it floated on the river like a yellow leaf in autumn unquote. The French governor and missionaries all saw and admired these birch bark canoes. Father Chalvois wrote a beautiful and vivid description of them. All the early travelers noted their ticklish balance. Wood, writing in 1634, said, quote, In these cockling flyboats, an Englishman can scarce sit without a fearful tottering. Unquote. And Madame Knights, a century later, said in her vivid English of a trip in one quote, The canoe was very small and shallow, which greatly terrified me and caused me to be very circumspect sitting with my hands fast on each side my eyes steady not daring so much as to lodge my tongue a hair's breadth more on one side of my mouth than t'other nor so much to think on lot's wife for a very thought would have overset our weary unquote when boats and vessels were built by the colonists they were in forms or had names but little used today shallop catch pink and snow are rarely heard sloops were early built but schooner is a modern term bateau and periagua still are used and the gundalo picturesque with its lanteen sail still is found on our northern new england shores the indians had narrow footpaths in many places through the woods on them foot travel was possible though many estuaries and rivers intersected the coast for the narrow streams could be crossed on natural fordways or on rude bridges of fallen trees which the english government ordered to be put in place as late as sixteen thirty one governor endicott would not go from salem to boston to visit governor winthrop because he was not strong enough to wade across the fords he might have done as governor winthrop did the next year when he went to plymouth to visit governor bradford and it took him two days to get there he might have been carried across the fords pickaback by an indian guide the indian paths were good though only two or three feet wide and in many places the savages kept the woods clear from underbrush by burning over large tracks when king philip's war took place all the land around the indian settlements in narragansett and eastern massachusetts was so free of brush that horsemen could ride everywhere freely through the woods. Some of the old paths are famous in our history. The most so was the Bay Path, which ran from Cambridge through Marlborough, Worcester, Oxford, Brookfield, and on to Springfield and the Connecticut River holland's beautiful story called by the name of the path gives its history its sentiment and much that happened on it in olden times when new paths were cut through the forest the settler blazed the trees that is they chopped a piece of the bark off tree after tree standing on the side of the way 
thus the blazes stood out clear and white in the dark shadows of the forests like welcome guideposts showing the traveller his way in maryland roads turning off to a church were marked by slips or blazes cut near the ground in maryland and virginia what were known as and indeed are still called rolling roads were cut through the forest they were narrow roads down which hogsheads of tobacco fitted with axles could be drawn or rolled from inland plantations to the river or bayside sometimes the hogsheads were simply rolled by human propulsion not dragged on these roads the broad rivers soon had canoe ferries the first regular massachusetts ferry from charleston to boston was in sixteen thirty nine it carried passengers for three pence apiece from chelsea to boston was four pence in sixteen thirty six the cambridge ferryman charged but half a penny as so many wished to attend the thursday lecture in the boston churches we learn from the massachusetts laws that often a rider had to let his horse cross by swimming over being guided from the ferry boat he then paid no ferriage for the horse after wheeled vehicles were used these ferries were not large enough to carry them properly often the carriage had to be taken apart or towed over while the horse had his forefeet in one canoe ferry and his hind feet in another the two canoes being lashed together the rope ferry lingered till our own day and was ever a picturesque sight on the river as soon as roads were built there were of course bridges and cartways but these were only between the closely neighboring towns usually the bridges were merely horse bridges with a railing on but one side after the period of walking and canoe riding had had its day nearly all land travel for a century was on horseback just as it was in england at that date in sixteen seventy two there were only six stage coaches in the whole of great britain and a man wrote a pamphlet protesting that they encouraged too much travel boston then had one private coach women and children usually rode seated on a pillion behind a man a pillion was a padded cushion with straps which sometimes had on one side a sort of platform stirrup one way of progress which would help four persons ride part of their journey was what was called the ride and tie system two of the four persons who were traveling started on their road on foot two mounted on the saddle and pillion rode about a mile dismounted tied the horse and walked on when the two who had started on foot reached the waiting horse they mounted rode on past the other couple for a mile or so dismounted tied and walked on and so on it was also a universal and courteous as it was a pleasant custom for friends to ride out on the road a few miles with any departing guest or friend and then bid them godspeed agatewards 
In 1704, a Boston schoolmistress named Madame Knights rode from Boston to New York on horseback. She was probably the first woman to make the journey, and it was a great and daring undertaking. She had as a companion the post. Quote unquote. This was the mail carrier who also rode on horseback. One of his duties was to assist and be kind to all persons who cared to journey in his company. The first regular mail started from New York to Boston on January 1, 1673. The postman carried two portmantles, which were crammed with letters and parcels. He did not change horses till he reached Hartford. He was ordered to look out and report the condition of all ferries, fords, and roads. He had to be active, stout, indefatigable, and honest. When he delivered his mail, it was laid on a table at an inn, and any one who wished looked over all the letters, then took and paid the postage, which was very high, on any address to himself. It was usually about a month from the setting out of, quote, the post, unquote, in winter till his return. As late certainly as 1730, the mail was carried from New York to Albany in the winter by a quote, foot post. Unquote. He went up the Hudson River, and lonely enough it must have been. Probably he skated up once the ice was good. This mail was only sent at irregular intervals. In 1760, there were but eight mails a year from Philadelphia to the Potomac River, and even then the post rider need not start till he had received enough letters to pay the expenses of the trip. It was not till postal affairs were placed in the capable and responsible hands of Benjamin Franklin that there were any regular or trustworthy mails. The journal and the report of Hugh Finlay, a post office surveyor in 1773, of the mail service from Quebec to St. Augustine, Florida, tells of the vivisitudes of mail matter even at that later day. In some places the deputy, as the postmaster was called, had no office, so his family rooms were constantly invaded. Occasionally a tavern served as a post office. Letters were thrown down on a table, and if the weather was bad, or smallpox raged, or the deputy were careless, they were not forwarded for many days. Letters that arrived might lie on the table or bar counter for days for any one to pull over until the owner chanced to arrive and claim them. Good service could scarcely be expected from any deputy, for his salary was paid according to the number of letters coming to his office. And as private mail carriage constantly went on, though forbidden by British law, the deputy suffered. Quote, if an information were large, but an informer would get tarred and feathered, no jury would find the fact." Unquote. The government writers were in truth the chief offenders. Any ship's captain or wagon driver or post rider could carry merchandise. Therefore, small sham bundles of paper, straw, or chips would be tied to a large sealed packet of letter and both be exempt from postage paid to the crown. The post rider between Boston and Newport 
loaded his carriage with bundles real and sham which delayed him long in delivery he bought and sold on commission along this road and in violation of law he carried many letters to his own profit he took twenty-six hours to go eighty miles had the newport deputy dared to complain he would have incurred much odium and been declared a quote, friend of slavery and oppression unquote. Quote, old herd unquote, the writer from saybrook to new york had been in the service forty-six years and had made a good estate he coolly took postage of all way letters as his perquisite was a money carrier and transferer all advantage to his own pocket carried merchandise returned horses for travellers and when finley saw him he was waiting for a yoke of oxen he was paid for fetching along some miles a pennsylvania post rider an aged man occupied himself as he slowly jogged along by knitting mittens and stockings not always were mail portmanteau properly locked hence many letters were lost and the pulling in and out of bundles defaced the letters of course so much horseback riding made it necessary to have horse blocks in front of nearly all houses in course of time stones were set every mile on the principal roads to tell the distance from town to town benjamin franklin set millstones the entire way on the post road from boston to philadelphia he rode in a chaise over the road and a machine which he had invented was attached to the chaise and it was certainly the first cyclometer that went on that road over which so many cyclometers have passed during the last five years it measured the miles as he traveled when he had ridden a mile he stopped from a heavy cart loaded with milestones which kept alongside the chaise a stone was dropped which was afterwards set by a gang of men a number of old colonial milestones are still standing there is one in worcester on what was the new connecticut path one in springfield on the bay path and there are several of benjamin franklin's setting one being at stratford connecticut the inland transportation of freight was carried on in the colonies just as it was in europe on the backs of pack horses very interesting historical evidence in relation to the methods of transportation in the middle of the eighteenth century may be found in the ingenious advertisement and address with which benjamin franklin raised transportation facilities for braddock's army in seventeen fifty five this is one of his most characteristic literary production braddock's appeals to the philadelphia assembly for a rough wagon road and wagons for the army succeeded in raising only twenty-five wagons franklin visited him in his desolate plight and agreed to assist him and appealed to the public to send to him for the use of the army a hundred and fifty wagons and fifteen hundred pack horses for the latter franklin offered to pay two shillings a day each as long as used if provided with a pack saddle twenty horses were sent with their loads to the camp as gifts to the british officers as a good and definite list of the load of one of these pack horses was expected to carry as well as a record of the kind of provisions 
grateful to an officer of that day, let me give an inventory. Quote, six pounds loaf sugar, six pounds muscovado sugar, one pound green tea, one pound bohia tea, six pounds ground coffee, six pounds chocolate, one half chest best white biscuit, one half pound pepper, one quart white vinegar, two dozen bottles O Madeira wine, two gallons Jamaica spirits, one bottle flour of mustard, two well cured hams, one half dozen cured tongues, six pounds rice, six pounds raisins, one Gloucester cheese, one keg containing twenty pounds best butter. The wagons and horses were all lost after Braddock's defeat or were seized by the French and Indians, and Franklin had many anxious months of responsibility for damages from the owners but I am confident the officers got all the provisions. Franklin gathered the wagons in York and Lancaster. No two English shires could have done better at that time than did these Pennsylvania counties. In Pennsylvania, Western Virginia, and Ohio, pack horses long were used, and a pretty picture is drawn by Doddridge and many other local historians of the trains of these horses and their gay collars and stuffed bells as laden with furs, ginseng, and snake root. They filed down the mountain roads to the towns and came home laden with salt, nails, tea, pewter plates, etc., at night the horses were hobbled, and the clappers of their bells were loosened. The ringing prevented the horses being lost. The animals started on their journey with two hundred pounds burden, of which part was provender for horses and man, which was left at convenient relays to be taken up on the way home. Two men could manage fifteen pack horses, which were tethered successively each to the pack saddle of the one in front of him. One man led the foremost horse, and the driver followed the file to watch the packs and urge on the laggards. Their numbers were vast. Five hundred were counted at one time in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, going westward. It was a costly method of transportation. Mr. Howland says that in 1784 the expense of carrying a ton's weight from Philadelphia to Erie by pack horses was $249. It is interesting to note that the routes taken by those men, skilled only in humble woodcraft, were the same ones followed in later years by the engineers of the turnpikes and railroads. As the roads were somewhat better in Pennsylvania than in some other provinces and more needed, so wagons soon were far greater in number. Indeed, during the Revolution, nearly all the wagons and horses used by the army came from that state. There was developed in Pennsylvania by the soft soil of these many roads, as well as by various topographical conditions, a splendid example of a true American vehicle, one which was a long time the highest type of a commodious freight carrier in this or any other country, the Conestoga wagon, the finest wagon the world has ever known. 
they were first used in any considerable number about seventeen sixty they had broad wheel tires and one of the peculiarities was a decided curve in the bottom analogous to that of a galley or canoe which made it specially fitted for traversing mountain roads for this curved bottom prevented freight from slipping too far at either end when going up or down hill this body was universally painted a bright blue and furnished with sideboards of an equally vivid red the wagon bodies were arched over with six or eight stately bows of which the middle ones were the lowest and the others rose gradually in front and rear till the end bows were nearly of equal height over them all was stretched a strong white hempen cover well corded down at the sides and ends these wagons could be loaded up to the bows and could carry four to six tons in weight the rates between philadelphia and pittsburgh were about two dollars a hundred pounds the horses four to seven in number were magnificent often matched throughout some were a dapple gray or all bay the harnesses of best materials and appearance were costly each horse had a large housing of deerskin or heavy bearskin trimmed with deep scarlet fringe while the headstall was tied with bunches of gay ribbons bell teams were common each horse except the saddle horse then had a full set of bells tied with high colored ribbons the horses were highly fed and when the driver seated on the saddle horse drew rein on the prancing leader and flourished his fine bull-hide london whip making the silk snap and tingle round the leader's ears every horse started off with the ponderous load with a grace and ease that was beautiful to see the wagons were first used in the conestoga valley and most extensively used there and the sleek powerful draft horses known as the conestoga breed were attached to them hence their name these teams were objects of pride to their owners objects of admiration and attention wherever they appeared and are objects of historical interest and satisfaction to-day often a prosperous teamster would own several conestoga wagons and driving the leading and handsomest team himself would start off his proud procession from twenty to a hundred would follow in close row large numbers were constantly passing at one time ten thousand ran from philadelphia to other towns josiah quincy told of the road at lancaster being lined with them the scene on the road between the cumberland valley and greensburg where there were five distinct and noble mountain ranges tuscarora rays hill allegheny laurel hills and chestnut ridge when a long train of white-topped conestoga wagons appeared and wound along the mountain sides was picturesque and beautiful with a charm unparalleled to-day many a fleet of them in one long upward winding row it ever was a noble sight as from the distant mountain height or quiet valley far below their snow-white covers looked like sail unquote. there were two classes of conestoga wagons and wagoners the regulars or men who made it their constant and only business and militia a local poet thus describes these outfits 
militia men drove narrow treads four horses and plain red dutch beds and always carried grub and feed there were farmers or common teamsters who made occasional trips usually in winter time and did some carriage for others and drove but four horses with their wagons the regulars had broad tires carried no feed for horses nor food for themselves but both classes of teamsters carried coarse mattresses and blankets which they spread side by side and row after row on the barroom floor of the tavern at which they put up their horses when unharnessed fed from long troughs hitched to the wagon pole the wagons that plied between the delaware and the small city of pittsburg were called pit teams the life of the conestoga wagon did not end even with the establishment of railroads in the eastern states farther and farther west it penetrated ever chosen by immigrants and travelers to the frontiers and at last in its old age in an equal career of usefulness as the prairie schooner in which vast numbers of families safely crossed the prairies of our far west the white tilts of the wagons thus passed and repassed till our own day four-wheeled wagons were but little used in new england till after the war of eighteen twelve two-wheeled carts and sleds carried inland freight which was chiefly transported over the snow in the winter the conestoga wagon of the past century was far ahead of anything in england at that date indeed mr c w ernst the best authority i know on the subject says we had in every way far better traffic facilities at that time than england in other ways we excelled though finlay found many defects in the postal service in seventeen seventy three he also found the stavers mail coach plying between boston and portsmouth long before england had such a thing mr ernst says the stavers mail coach was stunning used six horses when roads were bad and never was late they had no mail coaches in england till after the revolution and i believe massachusetts men introduced the idea in england we are apt to grow retrospectively sentimental over delights aesthetic and physical of ancient stagecoach days those days are not so ancient as many fancy the first stagecoach which ran directly from philadelphia to new york in seventeen sixty six and primitive enough it was was called the flying machine a good stage wagon set on springs its swift trip occupied two days in good weather it was but a year later than the original stagecoach between edinburgh and glasgow at that time in favorable weather the coach between london and edinburgh made the trip in thirteen days the london mail coach in its palmiest days could make this trip in forty-three hours and a half as early as seventeen eighteen jonathan wardwell advertised that he would run a stage to rhode island in seventeen sixty seven a stage coach was run during the summer months between boston and providence in seventeen seventy a stage chaise started between salem and boston and a post chaise between boston and portsmouth the following year as early as seventeen thirty two some common carrier lines had wagons which would carry a few passengers let us hear the testimony of some travellers as to the glorious pleasure of stagecoach travelling describing a trip between boston and new york towards the end of the last century 
President Quincy of Harvard College, said, quote, The carriages were old and the shackling much of the harness made of ropes. One pair of horses carried us eighteen miles. We generally reached our resting place for the night if no accident intervened at ten o'clock and after a frugal supper went to bed with a notice that we should be called at three next morning which generally proved to be half past two and then whether it snowed or rain the traveller must rise and make ready by the help of a horn lantern and a farthing candle and proceed on his way over bad roads sometimes getting out to help the coachman lift the coach out of a quagmire or rut and arrived in new york after a week's hard travelling wondering at the ease as well as the expedition with which our journey was effected Unquote. The Columbia Sentinel of April 24, 1793, advertised a new line of small, genteel, and easy stage carriages from Boston to New York with four inside passengers and smart horses. Many of the announcements of the day have pictures of the coaches they usually resemble market wagons with round canvas covered tops and the driver is seated outside the body of the wagon with his feet on the footboard trunks were small covered with deerskin or pigskin studded with brass nails and each traveller took his trunk under his seat and feet the poet moore gives in rhyme his testimony of virginia roads in eighteen hundred dear george though every bone is aching after the shaking i've had this week over ruts and ridges and bridges made of a few uneasy planks in open ranks over rivers of mud whose names alone would make knock the knees of stoutest man unquote. the traveller weld in seventeen ninety five gave testimony that the bridges were so poor that the driver had always to stop and arrange the loose planks ere he dared cross and he adds quote, the driver frequently had to call to the passengers in the stage to lean out of the carriage first on one side then on the other to prevent it from oversetting in the deep roads with which the road abounds now gentlemen to the right upon which the passengers all stretched their bodies halfway out of the carriage to balance on that side now gentlemen to the left and so on unquote. the coach in which this pleasure trip was taken is shown in the illustration entitled american stage wagon it is copied from a first edition of weld's travels ann warder in her journey from philadelphia to new york in seventeen fifty nine notes two overturned and abandoned stage wagons at perth amboy and many other travellers give similar testimony in seventeen ninety six the trip from philadelphia to baltimore took five days the growth in stage coaches and travel came with the turnpike at the beginning of this century in transportation and travel improvements of roadways is ever associated with improvement of vehicles the first extensive turnpike was the one between philadelphia and lancaster built in seventeen ninety two 
the growth and cost of these roads may be briefly mentioned by quoting a statement from the annual message of the governor of pennsylvania in eighteen thirty eight that the commonwealth then had two thousand five hundred miles of turnpike that had cost thirty seven million dollars many of these turnpikes were beautiful and splendid roads for instance the mohawk and hudson turnpike which ran in a straight line from albany to schenectady was ornamented and shaded with two rows of the quickly growing and fashionable poplar trees and thickly punctuated with taverns on one turnpike there were sixty-five taverns in sixty miles the dashing stagecoach accorded well with this fine thoroughfare with the splendid turnpikes came the glorious coaching days in eighteen twenty seven the travellers register reported eight hundred stage coaches arriving and as many leaving boston each week the forty mile road from boston to providence sometimes saw twenty coaches going each way the editor of the providence gazette wrote quote, we were rattled from boston to providence in four hours and fifty minutes if any one wants to go faster he may go to kentucky and charter a streak of lightning unquote. there were four rival lines on the cumberland road the national good intent pioneer and june bug some spirited races the old stage road witnessed between the rival lines the distance from wheeling to cumberland one hundred and thirty two miles was regularly accomplished in twenty four hours no heavy luggage was carried and but nine passengers fourteen coaches rolled off together one was a mail coach with a horn relays were every ten miles teams were changed before the coach ceased rocking one driver boasted of changing and harnessing his four horses in four minutes lady travellers were quickly thrust in the open door and their bandboxes after them scant time was there for refreshment save by uncorking of bottles the keen test and acute rivalry between drivers came in the delivery of the president's message dan gordon carried the message thirty-two miles in two hours and thirty minutes changing horses three times bill noble carried the message from wheatling to hagerstown a hundred and eighty-five miles in fifteen and a half hours in eighteen eighteen the eastern stage company which charted in the state of new hampshire the route was this a stage started from portsmouth at nine a m passengers dined at topsfield thence through danvers and salem back the following day dining at newburyport the capital stock was four hundred and twenty five shares at a hundred dollars par in eighteen thirty four the stock was worth two hundred dollars a share the company owned several hundred horses it was on a coach of this line that henry clay rode from pleasant street salem to tremont house boston in exactly an hour and on the route extended to portland daniel webster was carried at the rate of sixteen english miles an hour from boston to portland to sign the ashburton treaty the middle of the century saw the beginning of the end of coaching in all the states that had been colonies further west the old stagecoach had to trundle in order to exist at all ohio indiana missouri across the plains and, and then over the rocky mountains to salt lake 
the road from carson to plainville gave the crack ride and the driver wore yellow kid gloves the coach known as the concord wagon drawn by six horses still makes cheerful the out-of-the-way roads of our western states and recalls the life of olden times the story of spirit and gay life still exists in the wells fargo express the usefulness of the concord coach is not limited to the western nor the northern portion of our continent in south america it flourishes banishing all rivals canal travel and transportation were proposed at the close of provincial days and a few short canals were built benjamin franklin was early awake to their practicability and value among the stock owners of the dismal swamp canal was george washington and he was equally interested in the potomac canal the erie canal first proposed to the new york legislature in seventeen sixty eight was completed in eighteen twenty five there was considerable passenger travel on this canal at a cent a half mile a mile and a half an hour horace greeley has given an excellent picture of this leisurely travel it was asserted by some that stage coaches were doomed by the canal boat but they continued to exist till they encountered a more formidable rival until turnpike days all small carriages were two-wheeled chaises chairs and sulkies were those generally used the chaises and harness used by jonathan trumbull brother jonathan are here shown with regard to private conveyances whether coaches chaises or chairs the colonies kept close step from earliest days with the mother countries randolph noted with envy boston coaches of the seventeenth century parson thatcher was accused and reprehended in sixteen seventy five for making visits with a coach and four coaches were taxed both in england and america so we knew exactly how plentiful they were there were as many in massachusetts in seventeen fifty in proportion to the number of inhabitants as there were in england in eighteen thirty judge sewell's diary often refers to private coaches and one of the most amusing scenes it depicts is his continued and ingenious argument when wooing madam winthrop for his third wife when she stipulated that he should keep a coach and his frugal mind disposed him not to do it coach building prospered in the colonies lucas and paddock in boston rose in new york made beautiful and rich coaches materials were ample and varied in the new world for carriage building horse flesh not over choice to be sure became over plentiful it was said that no man ever walked in america save a vagabond or a fool a coach made from madame angelica campbell of schenectady new york by coach builder ross in seventeen ninety is here shown it is now owned by mr john d campbell of rotterdam new york sleighs were common in new york a half century before they were in boston madame knights noted the fast racing in sleighs in new york when she was there in seventeen o four one other curious conveyance of colonial days should be spoken of a sedan chair this was a strong covered chair fastened on two bars with handles like a litter and might be carried by two or four persons when sedan chairs were so much used in england they were sure to be somewhat used in cities in america one was presented to governor winthrop as early as sixteen forty six portion of a capture from a spanish galleon judge sewell wrote in seventeen o six five indians carried mr broomfill in a chair this was in the country down on cape cod and doubtless four indians carried him while one rested as late as seventeen eighty nine eliza quincy saw dr franklin riding in a sedan chair in philadelphia 
the establishment and building of roads bridges and opening of inns show that mutual interest which marks civilization and separates us from the lonely selfish life of a savage soon inns were found everywhere in the northern colonies in new england new york and pennsylvania an inn was called an ordinary a victualling a cook shop or a tavern before we had our modern word hotel board was not very high at early inns the prices were regulated by the different towns in sixteen thirty three the salem innkeeper could only have sixpence for a meal this was at the famous anchor tavern which was kept as a hostelry for nearly two centuries at the ship tavern board lodging wine at dinner and beer between meals cost three shillings a day great care was taken by the magistrates to choose responsible men and women to keep taverns and they would not permit too many taverns in one town at first the tavern keeper could not sell sack which was sherry nor strong intoxicating liquors to travellers but he could sell beer provided it was good for a penny a quart nor could he sell cakes or buns except at a wedding or funeral he could not allow games to be played nor singing or dancing to take place we know from shakespeare's plays that the different rooms in english inns had names this was also the custom in new england the star chamber rose and sun chamber blue chamber jerusalem chamber were some of them many of the taverns of revolutionary days and some of colonial times are still standing a few have even been taverns since first built others have served many other uses a well-preserved old house built in sixteen ninety in sudbury massachusetts was originally known as the red horse tavern but has acquired greater fame as the wayside inn of longfellow's tales its tap-room with raftered ceiling and cage-like bar with swinging gate is a picturesque room and is one of the few old tap-rooms left unaltered in new england every inn had a name usually painted on its swinging sideboard with some significant emblem these names were simply repetitions of old english tavern signs until revolutionary days when patriotic landlords eagerly invented and adopted names significant of the new nation the scarlet coat of king george became the blue and buff of george washington and the eagle of the united states took the place of the british lion the signboard was an interesting survival of feudal times and with its old-time carved and forged companions such as vanes and weathercocks door knockers and figureheads formed a picturesque element of decoration and symbolism many chapters might be written on historic commemorative emblematic heraldic biblical humorous or significant signs nearly all of which have vanished from public gaze as has disappeared also the general incapacity to read which made pictorial devices a necessity gilders painter stainers smiths and joiners all helped to make the tavern sign a thing of varied workmanship if not of art it is said that philadelphia excelled in the quantity and quality of her signboards with fair roads for colonial days the best and amplest system of transportation and the splendid conestoga wagons great inns multiplied throughout pennsylvania in baltimore both taverns and signs were many and varied from the three loggerheads to the indian queen with its two hundred guest rooms and a bell in every room and the fountain inn built around a shady court with galleries on every story like the tabard inn at southwark 
the swinging sideboard of john nash's tavern at amherst massachusetts is here reproduced from the history of amherst it is a good type of the ordinary sideboard which was found hanging in front of every tavern a century ago in virginia and the carolinas taverns were not so plentiful nor so necessary for a traveller might ride from maryland to georgia and be sure of a welcome at every private house on the way some planters eager for company and news stationed negroes at the gate to invite passers-by on the post-road to come into the house and be entertained berkeley in his history of virginia wrote quote, the inhabitants are very courteous to travellers who need no other recommendation than being human creatures a stranger has no more to do but to inquire upon the road where any gentleman or good housekeeper lives and then he may depend upon being received with hospitality this good nature is so general among their people that the gentry when they go abroad order their principal servants to entertain all visitors with everything the plantation offers and the poor planters who have but one bed will often sit up or lie upon a form or couch all night to make room for a weary traveller to repose himself after his journey unquote so universal was this custom of free entertainment that it was a law in virginia that unless there had been a distinct agreement to pay for board and shelter no pay could be claimed for any guest no matter how long he remained in the few taverns that existed prices were low about a shilling a dinner and it was ordered that the meal must be wholesome and good the governor of new netherlands at first entertained all visitors to new amsterdam at his house in the fort but as commerce increased he found this hospitality burdensome and a harbour or tavern was built it was later used as a city hall in england throughout the seventeenth century and indeed much later traversing the great cities by night was a matter of some danger the streets were ill-lighted were full of holes and mud and filth and were infested with thieves worse still groups of drunken and dissipated young men of wealth calling themselves mohawks scorers and other names roamed the dark streets armed with swords and bludgeons assaulting tormenting and injuring every one whom they met who had the ill fortune to be abroad at night there was nothing of that sort known in american cities there was little noise or roistering no highway robbery comparative little petty stealing the streets were ill-paved and dirty and were not foul with the accumulated dirt of centuries as in london the streets in nearly all cities were unlighted in sixteen ninety seven new yorkers were ordered to have a lantern and candle hung out on a pole from every seventh house and as the watchman walked around he called out lanthorn and a whole candle light hang out your lights the watchman was called a rattle watch and carried a long staff and a lantern and a large rattle or clopper which he struck to frighten away thieves and all night long he called out each hour and told the weather for instance he called out past midnight all's well one o'clock and fair winds or five o'clock and cloudy skies thus one could lie safe in bed and if he chanced to waken could know that the friendly rattle watch was near at hand and what was the weather and the time of night in sixteen fifty eight new york had in all ten watchmen who were like our modern police today it has many thousands in new england the constables and watch were all carefully appointed by law they carried black staves six feet long tipped with brass and hence were called tip staves the night watch was called a bellman he looked out for fire and thieves and other disorders and called the time of the night and the weather 
the pay was small often but a shilling a night and occasionally a coat of kersey in large towns as in boston and salem thirteen sober honest men and householders were the night watch the highest in the community even the magistrate took their turn at the watch and were ordered to walk two together a young man with quote, one of the soberer sort unquote. end of chapter fourteen Chapter 15 of Home Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morse Earl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunday in the Colonies. The first building used as a church at the Plymouth Colony was the fort and to it the pilgrim fathers and mothers and children walked on sunday reverently and gravely three in a row the men fully armed with swords and guns till they built a meeting-house in sixteen forty eight in other new england settlements the first services were held in tents under trees or under any shelter the settler who had a roomy house often had also the meeting the first boston meeting house had mud walls a thatched roof and earthen floor it was used till sixteen forty and some very thrilling and inspiring scenes were enacted within its humble walls usually the earliest meeting-houses were log-houses with clay-filled chinks and roofs thatched with reeds and long grass like the dwelling-houses at salem is still preserved one of the early churches the second and more dignified form of new england meeting-house was usually a square wooden building with a truncated pyramidal roof surmounted often with a belfry which served as a lookout station and held a bell from which the bell rope hung down to the floor in the center of the church aisle the old church at hingham massachusetts still standing and still used is a good specimen of this shape it was built in sixteen eighty one and is known as the old ship and is a comely and dignified building as more elegant and costly dwelling-houses were built so were better meeting-houses and the third form with lofty wooden steeple at one end in the style of architecture invented by sir christopher wren after the great fire of london multiplied and increased until every town was graced with an example in all these the main body of the edifice remained as bare prosaic and undecorated as were the preceding churches while all the ambition of both builders and congregation spent itself in the steeple these were so varied and at times so beautiful that a chapter might be written on new england steeples the old south church in boston is a good example of this school of ecclesiastical architecture and is a well-known historic building as well 
the earliest meeting houses had oiled paper in the windows and when glass came it was not set with putty but was nailed in the windows had what was termed quote, heavy current side shutters unquote. the outside of the meeting house was not colored or stained as it was then termed but was left to turn gray and weather stained and sometimes moss covered with the dampness of the great shadowing hemlock and fir trees which were usually planted around new england churches the first meeting houses were often decorated in a very singular and grotesque manner rewards were paid by all the early towns for killing wolves and any person who killed a wolf brought the head to the meeting house and nailed it to the outer wall the fierce grinning heads and splashes of blood made a grim and horrible decoration all kinds of notices were also nailed to the meeting-house door where all of the congregation might readily see them notices of town meetings of sales of cattle or farms lists of town officers prohibitions from selling guns to the indians notices of intended marriages venues etc it was the only meeting place the only method of advertisement in front of the church was usually a row of stepping stones or horse blocks for nearly all came on horseback and often on the meeting house green stood the stocks pillory and whipping post a verse from an old-fashioned hymn reads thus new england's sabbath day is heaven-like still and pure when israel walks the way up to the temple's door the time we tell when there to come by beat of drum or sounded shell Unquote. the first church at jamestown virginia gathered the congregation by beat of the drum but while attendants of the episcopal roman catholic and dutch reformed churches in the new world were in general being summoned to divine service by the ringing of a bell hung either over the church or in the branches of a tree by its side new england puritans were summoned as the hymn relates by drum or horn or shell the shell was a great conch shell and a man was hired to blow it a mournful sound at the proper time which was usually nine o'clock in the morning in stockbridge massachusetts the church shell was afterwards used for many years as a signal to begin and stop work in the haying field in windsor connecticut a man walked up and down on a platform on the top of the meeting-house and blew a trumpet to summon worshippers many churches had a church drummer who stood on the roof or in the belfry and drummed a few raised a flag as a summons or fired a gun within the meeting-house all was simple enough raftered walls puncheon and sanded or earthen floors rows of benches a few pews all of unpainted wood and a pulpit which was usually a high desk overhung by a heavy sounding board which was fastened to the roof by a slender metal rod 
the pulpit was sometimes called a scaffold when pews were built they were square with high partition walls and had narrow uncomfortable seats round three sides the word was always spelled pew p u e and they were sometimes called pits a little girl in the middle of this century attended a service in an old church which still retained the old-fashioned square pews she exclaimed in a loud voice quote, what must i be shut up in a closet and sit on a shelf Unquote these narrow shelf-like seats were usually hung on hinges and could be turned up against the pew walls during the long psalm tunes and prayers so the members of the congregation could lean against the pew walls for support as they stood when the seats were let down they fell with a heavy slam that could be heard half a mile away in the summer time when the windows of the meeting house were open lines from an old poem read quote, and when at last the loud amen fell from aloft how quickly then the seats came down with heavy rattle like musketry in fiercest battle unquote. a few of the old-time meeting-houses with high pulpits square pews and deacon seats still remain in new england the interior of the rocky hill meeting-house at salisbury massachusetts is here shown it fully illustrates the words of the poet quote, old house of puritanic wood through whose unpainted windows streamed on seats as primitive and rude as jacob's pillow when he dreamed the white and undiluted day unquote. the seats were carefully and thoughtfully assigned by a church committee called the seating committee the best seats being given to older persons of wealth and dignity who attended the church whittier wrote of this custom quote, in the goodly house of worship where in order due and fit as by public vote directed classed and ranked the people sit mistress first and goodwife after clerkly squire before the clown from the brave coat lace embroidered to the gray coat shading down unquote. many of the plans for seating the meeting-house have been preserved the pews and their assigned occupants are clearly designated a copy is shown of one now in deerfield memorial hall in the early meeting-houses men and women sat on separate sides of the meeting-house as in quaker meetings till our own time sometimes a group of young women or of young men were permitted to sit in the gallery together little girls sat beside their mothers or on footstools at their feet or sometimes on the gallery stairs and i have heard of a little cage or frame to hold puritan babies in meeting boys did not sit with their families but were in groups by themselves usually on the pulpit and gallery stairs where tithing men watched over them in salem in 1676 it was ordered by the town that quote, all ye boys of ye town are appointed to sit upon ye three pair of stairs in ye meeting-house and william lord is appointed to look after ye boys upon ye pulpit stairs unquote. in stratford the tithing man was ordered to 
quote, watch over youths of disorderly carriage and see they behave themselves comely and use such raps and blows as is in his discretion meet unquote. in durham any misbehaving boy was punished publicly after the service was over we would nowadays scarcely see twenty or thirty active boys together in church if we wish them to be models of attention and dignified behavior but after the boys seats were removed from the pulpit stairs they were all turned in together in the boys pews in the gallery there was a boys pew in windsor connecticut as late as eighteen forty five and pretty noisy it usually was a certain small boy in connecticut misbehaved himself on sunday and his wickedness was specified by the justice of the peace as follows quote, a rude and idle behavior in the meeting-house such as smiling and laughing and in enticing others to the same evil such as laughing or smiling or pulling the hair of his neighbor menoni simpkins in the time of pummeling worship such as throwing sister pentecost perkins on the ice it being sabbath day between the meeting-house and his place of abode unquote. I can picture well the wicked scene, poor meek little Benoni Simpkins trying to behave well in meeting and not cry out when the young, quote, wanton gospeller, unquote, pulled her hair, and unfortunate sister Perkins tripped up on the ice by the young rascal. Another vain youth in Andover, Massachusetts, was brought up before the magistrate, and it was charged that he, quote, sported and played and by indecent gestures and wry faces caused laughter and misbehavior in the beholders unquote. the girls were just as wicked they slammed down the pew seats tabitha morgus of norwich quote, profaned the lord's day unquote, by her quote, rude and indecent behavior in laughing and playing in ye time of service unquote. on long island godless boys quote, ran races unquote, on the sabbath and quote, talked of vain things unquote. and as for albany children they played hooky and coasted down hill on sunday to the scandal of every one, evidently, except their parents. When the boys were separated and families sat in pews together, all became orderly in meeting. The deacons sat in a deacon's pew, just in front of the pulpit. Sometimes also there was a deaf pew, in front for those who were hard of hearing after choirs were established the singers seats were usually in the gallery and high up under the beams in a loft sat the negroes and indians if any person seated himself in any place which was not assigned to him he had to pay a fine usually of several shillings for each offence but in old newbury men were fined as high as twenty seven pounds each for persistent and unruly sitting in seats belonging to other members the churches were all unheated few had stoves until the middle of this century the chill of the damp buildings never heated from autumn to spring and closed and dark throughout the week was hard for every one to bear. In some of the early log-built meeting-houses, fur bags made of wolf-skins were nailed to the seats, and in winter church attendants thrust their feet into them. 
dogs too were permitted to enter the meeting house and lie on their master's feet dog whippers or dog pelters were appointed to control and expel them when they became unruly or unbearable women and children usually carried foot stoves which were little pierced metal boxes that stood on wooden legs and held hot coals during the noon intermission the half-frozen church attendants went to a neighboring house or tavern or to a noon house to get warm a noon house or sabbath day house as it was often called was a long low building built near the meeting house with horse stalls at one end and a chimney at the other in it the farmers kept says one church record their duds and horses a great fire of logs were built there each sunday and before its cheerful blaze noonday luncheons of brown bread doughnuts or gingerbread were eaten and foot stoves were filled boys and girls were not permitted to indulge in idle talk in these noon houses much less to play often two or three families built a noon house together or the church built a society house and there the children had a sermon read to them by a deacon during the nooning sometimes the children had to explain aloud the notes they had taken during the sermon in the morning thus they throve as a minister wrote on the good fare of brown bread and the gospel there was no nearer approach to a sunday school until this century the services were not shortened because the churches were uncomfortable by the side of the pulpit stood a brass-bound hourglass which was turned by the tithing man or clerk but it did not hasten the closing of the sermon sermons two or three hours long were customary and prayers from one to two hours in length when the first church in woburn was dedicated the minister preached a sermon nearly five hours long a dutch traveller recorded a prayer four hours long on a fast day many prayers were two hours long the doors were closed and watched by the tithing man and none could leave even if tired or restless unless with good excuse the singing of the psalms was tedious and unmusical just as it was in churches of all denominations both in america and england at that date singing was by ear and very uncertain and the congregation had no notes and many had no psalm books and hence no words so the psalms were lined or deacon that is a line was read by the deacon and then sung by the congregation some psalms when lined and sung occupied half an hour during which the congregation stood there were but eight or nine tunes in general use and even these were often sung incorrectly there were no church organs to help keep the singers together but sometimes pitch pipes were used to set the key bass viols clarinets and flutes were played upon at a later date in meeting to help the singing violins were too associated with dance music to be thought decorous for church music still the new england churches clung to and loved their poor confused psalm singing as one of their few delights and whenever a puritan even in road or field heard the distant sound of a psalm tune he removed his hat and bowed his head in prayer contributions at first were not collected by the deacons but the entire congregation one after another walked up to the deacon's seat and placed gifts of money goods wampum or promissory notes in a box 
when the services were ended all remained in the pews until the minister and his wife had walked up the aisle and out of the church the strict observance of sunday as a holy day was one of the characteristics of the puritans any profanation of the day was severely punished by fine or whipping citizens were forbidden to fish shoot sail row dance jump or ride save to and from church or to perform any work on the farm an infinite number of examples might be given to show how rigidly the laws were enforced the use of tobacco was forbidden near the meeting-house these laws were held to extend from sunset on saturday to sunset on sunday for in the first instructions given to governor endicott by the company in england it was ordered that all in the colony cease work at three o'clock in the afternoon on saturday the puritans found support of this belief in the scriptural words quote, the evening and the morning were the first day unquote. a sabbath day in the family of rev john cotton was thus described by one of his fellow ministers quote, he began the sabbath at evening therefore then performed family duty after supper being longer than ordinary in exposition after which he catechized his children and servants then returned to his study the morning following family worship being ended he retired into his study until the bell called him away upon his return from meeting where he had preached and prayed some hours he returned again into his study the place of his labor and prayer unto his favorite devotion where having a small repast carried him up for his dinner he continued until the tolling of the bell the public service of the afternoon being over he withdrew for a space to his pre-mentioned oratory for his sacred addresses to god as in the forenoon then came down repeated the sermon in the family prayed after supper sang a psalm and toward bedtime betaking himself again to his study he closed the day with prayer thus he spent the sabbath continually unquote the virginia cavaliers were strict church of england men and the first who came to the colony were strict sunday keepers rules were laid down to enforce sunday observance journeys were forbidden boat lading was prohibited also all profanation of the day by sports such as shooting fishing game playing etc the offender who broke the sabbath laws had to pay a fine and be set in the stocks when the sturdy watchdog of religion and government sir thomas dale came over he declared absence from church should be punishable by death but this severity never was executed the captain of the watch was made to play the same part as the new england tithing man every sunday half an hour before service time at the last tolling of the bell the captain stationed sentinels then searched all the houses and commanded and forced all except the sick to go to church then when all were driven churchwards before him he went with his guards to church himself captain john smith in his pathway to erect a plantation thus vividly described the first places of divine worship in virginia quote, we did hang an awning which is an old sail in three or four trees to shadow us from the sun our walls were rails of wood our seats unhewed trees till we cut planks our pulpit a bar of wood nailed to two neighboring trees 
In foul weather we shifted into an old rotten tent. This came by way of adventure for new. This was our church till we built a homely thing like a barn set upon cratchits, covered with raft, sedge, and earth. So also was the walls. The best of our houses were of like curiosity, that could neither well defend from wind nor rain. Yet we had daily common prayer, morning and evening, every Sunday two sermons, and every three months a holy communion, till our minister died. But our prayers daily with an homily on Sunday we continued two or three years after, till more preachers came. Unquote. A timber church sixty feet long took the place of this mud and clay chapel, and this was in turn replaced by the brick one whose ruined arches are still standing. The wooden church saw the most pompous ceremony of the day when the governor, de la Ware, or Delaware, as we now call it, in full dress, attended by all his counselors and officers, and fifty halbert-bearers in scarlet cloaks, filed within its flower-decked walls. This decoration of flowers was significant of the difference between the church edifices of the Puritans and of the Cavaliers. The churches of the southern colonies were, as a rule, much more richly furnished, Many were modeled and shaped after the old English churches and were built of stone, though Jonathan Butcher, the colonial clergyman, could write that the greater number of the southern churches were at the time of the Revolution, quote, composed of wood without spires or towers or steeples or bells, placed in retired and solitary spots and contiguous to springs or wells." Unquote. Many of the churches and chapels of ease stood by the waterside, and to the services came the church attendants in canoes, piri augers, dugouts, etc. It made an animated scene upon the water as the boats came rowing in and as they departed after the service. Sometimes the seats were comfortably cushioned, and they were carefully assigned as in the Puritan meetings. In some Virginia churches, seats in the galleries were deemed the most dignified. There was a pew for the magistrates, another for the magistrates' ladies, pews for the representatives and church wardens, vestrymen, etc. Persons crowded into pews above their stations, just as in New England, and were promptly displaced. Groups of men built pews together, and there were schoolboys' galleries and pews. The first clergyman in Virginia, Robert Hunt, a true man of God, came as a missionary, and he and others were men of marked intellect and religion. But in the eighteenth century the pay was too small and uncertain to attract any great men from the Church of England, and church attendance dwindled and became irregular. For in Virginia the parish was expected to receive any clergyman sent them from England, a rule which often proved unsatisfactory, and deservedly so, since some very disreputable offshoots of English families were thrust upon the Virginia churches. In the Carolinas, where the church chose its own clergyman, harmony and affection prevailed in the parishes, as it did among the New England Puritans. Though the Virginians did not always love their clergymen, still they were ever steadfast in their affection to their church, and regarded it as the only church. Sunday was not observed with as much rigidity in New Netherland as in New England, but strict rules and laws were made for enforcing quiet during service time fishing gathering berries or nuts playing in the streets working going on pleasure trips all were forbidden on long island shooting of wild fowl carting of grain travelling for pleasure all were punished 
in revolutionary times a cage was set up in city hall park near the present new york post office in which boys were confined who did not properly regard the sabbath before the dutch settlers had any church or dominies as they called their ministers they had crankby soakers or visitors of the sick who read sermons to an assembled congregation every sunday the first church at albany was much like the plymouth fort simply a blockhouse with loopholes through which the guns could be fired the roof was mounted with three cannon it had a seat for the magistrates and one for the deacons and a handsome octagonal pulpit which had been sent from holland and which still exists the edifice had a chandelier and candle sconces and two low galleries the first church in new amsterdam was of stone and was seventy-two feet long a favorite form of the dutch churches was six or eight sided with a high pyramidal roof topped with a belfry and a weather vane usually the windows were so small and of glass so opaque that the church was very dark a few of the churches were poorly heated with high stoves perched up on pillars the albanians connected each churches among them but all the women carried foot-stoves and some of the men carried muffs almost as important as the dominie was the vorleaser or chorister who was also generally the bell-ringer sexton grave-digger funeral inviter schoolmaster and sometimes town clerk he tuned the psalm turned the hourglass gave out the psalms on a hanging board to the congregation read the bible gave up notices to the dominie by sticking the papers in the end of a cleft stick and holding it up to the high pulpit the deacons had control of all the church money in the middle of the sermon they collected contributions by passing the sacji these were small cloth or velvet bags hung on the end of a pole six or eight feet long a french traveller told the dutch deacons pass round quote, the old square hat of the preacher unquote, on the end of a stick for the contributions usually there was a little bell on the sacji which rung when a coin was dropped in in many dutch churches the men sat in a row of pews around the wall while the women were seated on chairs in the centre of the church there were also a few benches or pews for persons of special dignity or for the minister's wife there were many other colonists of other religious faiths the roman catholic in maryland and the extreme southern colonies the quakers in pennsylvania the baptists in rhode island the huguenots lutherans moravians but all enjoined an orderly observance of the sabbath day and it may be counted as one of the great blessings of the settlement of america one of the most ennobling conditions of its colonization that it was made at a time when the deepest religious feeling prevailed throughout europe when devotion to some religion was found in every one when the bible was a newly found and deeply loved treasure when the very differences of religious belief and the formation of new sects made each cling more lovingly and more earnestly to his own faith End of chapter 15chapter 16 of home life in colonial days by alice morse earl this librivox recording is in the public domain colonial neighborliness if the first foundation of new england's strength and growth was godliness its next was neighborliness 
and a firm rock it proved to build upon it may seem anomalous to assert that while there was in olden times infinitely greater independence in each household than at present yet there was also greater interdependence with surrounding households it is curious to see how completely social ethics and relations have changed since olden days aid in our families in times of stress and need is not given to us now by kindly neighbors as of yore we have well arranged systems by which we can buy all that assistance and pay for it not with affectionate regard but with current coin the colonist turned to any and all who lived around him and never turned in vain for help in sickness or at the time of death of members of his household for friendly advice for culinary aids to a halting appetite for the preparation for feasting an exceptional number of persons in short in any unusual emergency as well as in frequent everyday cooperation in log rolling stone piling stump pulling wall building house raising etc all the hard and exhausting labor on the farm the word cooperation is modern but the thing itself is as old as civilization in a new country where there was much work to be done which one man or one family could not do under the mechanical conditions which then existed a working together or union of labor was necessary for progress indeed almost for obtaining a foothold the term quote, log rolling unquote, is frequently employed in its metaphorical sense in politics both by english and american writers who have vague knowledge of the original meaning of the word a log rolling in early pioneer days in the northern colonies and in western virginia and the central states was a noble example of generous cooperation where each gave of his best his time strength and good will and where all worked to clear the ground in the forest for a home farm for a neighbor who might be newly come and an entire stranger but who in turn would just as cheerfully and energetically give his work for others when it was needed with the vanishing of the log rolling and a score of similar kindly usages and customs has gone from our communities all traces of the old-time exalted type of neighborliness we nowadays have generalized our sentiments we have more philanthropy and less neighborliness we have love for mankind and less for men we are independent of our neighbors but infinitely more dependent on the world at large the personal element has been removed to a large extent from our social ethics we buy nursing and catering just as we hire our houses built and buy our corn ready ground 
doubtless everything we buy is infinitely better nevertheless our loss in affectionate zeal is great the plantation was the unit in virginia in new england it was the town the neighborly helpfulness of the new england settlers extended from small to great matters it formed communal privileges and entered into every department of town life for instance the town of gloucester in 1663 granted a right to a citizen for running a small sawmill for twenty-one years in return for this right the grantee was to sell boards to gloucester men at one shilling per hundred better cheap than to strangers and was to receive pay raised in the town Saco and bitterford in maine ordered that fellow townsmen should have preference in every employment other towns ordered certain persons to buy provisions of the townsmen in preference reading would not sell any of its felled timber out of the town thus the social compact called a town extended itself also into all the small doings of daily life and the mutual helpfulness made mutual interest that proved no small element of the force which bound all together in seventeen seventy six in a successful struggle for independence in outlying settlements and districts this feeling of mutual dependence and assistance was strong enough to give a name which sometimes lingered long the loomis neighborhood the mason neighborhood the robinson neighborhood were names distinctive for half a century and far more distinguishing an individual than the greenville mason town and longwood that succeeded them there was one curious and contradictory aspect of this neighborliness this kindliness this thought for mutual welfare and that was its narrowness especially in new england as regards the limitations of space and locality it is impossible to judge what caused this restraint of vision but it is certain that in generality and almost in universality just as soon as any group of settlers could call themselves a town these colonists notion of kindliness and thoughtfulness for others became distinctly and rigidly limited to their own townspeople the town was their whole world without doubt this was partly the result of the lack of travelling facilities and ample communication which made townships far more separated and remote from each other than states are to-day and made difficult the possibility of speedy or full knowledge of strangers this caused a constant suspicion of all newcomers especially those who chanced to enter with scant introduction and made universal a custom of quote, warning out unquote, all strangers who arrived in any town this formality was gone through with by the sheriff or tithing man thereafter should the worn ones proved incapable or unsuccessful or vicious they could not become a charge upon the town but could be returned whence they came with dispatch and violence if necessary 
by this means and by various attempts to restrict the powers of citizens to sell property to newcomers the town kept a jealous watch over the right of entry into the corporation Georgechester in sixteen thirty four enacted that quote, no man within the plantation shall sell his house or lot to any man without the plantation whom they shall dislike off unquote. providence would not permit a proprietor to sell to any but to an inhabitant without consent of the town new haven would neither sell nor let ground to a stranger hadley would sell no land to any until after three years occupation and then only with approval of the quote, town's mind unquote. in sixteen thirty seven the general court very reasonably questioned whether towns could legally restrain individuals from disposal of their own property but the custom was so established so in touch with the narrow exclusiveness of the colonists that it still prevailed the expression of the town of watertown when it would sell lots only to freemen of the congregation because it wished no strange neighbors but only to sit down there close together was the sentiment of all the towns one john stebbins who had twice served as a soldier of watertown and lived there seven years could not get a town lot the legal process of warning out of town had an element of the absurd in it and in one case that of mystery namely a sheriff appeared before the woebegotten intruder and said half laughing i warn you off the face of the earth let me get my hat before i go stammered the terrified wanderer who ran into the house for his hat and was never seen by any mortal eye in that town afterwards it has become a traditional of local folklore that he literally vanished from the earth at the command of the officer of the law the harboring of strangers even of relatives who were not local residents was a frequent source of bickering between citizens and magistrates as well as a constant cause of arbitration between towns a widow in dorchester was not permitted to entertain her own son-in-law from another town and her neighbor was fined in sixteen seventy one under distress for housing his own daughter she was a married woman and alleged she could not return to her husband on account of inclement weather as time passed on and immigration continued freemen clung closely to their right to keep out strangers and outsiders from the boston town records of seventeen fourteen we find citizens still prohibited from entertaining a stranger without giving notice to the town authorities and a description of the stranger and his circumstances boston required that all coming from ireland should be registered lest they become chargeable warnings and whippings out of town still continued all this was so contrary to the methods of colonies in other countries such as the barbados honduras etc where extraordinary privileges were offered settlers free and large grants of land absolvement from past debts etc that it makes an early example of the curious absorbing and assimilating power of american nationality which ever grew and grew even against such 
clogs and hampering restrictions in the sun colonies the same kindliness existed as in the north but the conditions differed john hammond of virginia wrote in sixteen fifty six in his lee and rachel this country is not only plentiful but pleasant and profitable pleasant in regard of the extraordinary good neighborhood and loving conversation they have with one another the inhabitants are generally affable courteous and very assistant to strangers for what but plenty makes hospitality and good neighborhood and no sooner are they settled but they will be visiting presenting and advising the strangers how to improve what they have how to better their way of livelihood in summer when fresh meat was killed the neighbors shared the luxury and in turn gave of their slaughter hammond adds quote, if any fall sick and cannot compass to follow his crops which would soon be lost the adjoining neighbor or upon request more join together and work it by spells until he recovers and that gratis so that no man by sickness lose any part of his year's work let any travel it is without charge and at every house is entertainment as in a hostelry Unquote. it was the same in the carolinas ramsay the early historian of south carolina said the hospitality was such a virtue that innkeepers complained that their business was not worth carrying on the doors of citizens were open to all decent travelers and shut to none the plantations were in many counties too far apart for any cooperative labor and the planters were not men of such vast strength or so great personal industry even in their own affairs as were the yankees there were slaves on each plantation to do all the hard work of lifting etc but in out-of-the-way settlements the virginia planters kindliness was shown in a vast and unbounded hospitality a hospitality so insatiable that it watched for and waylaid travelers to expend a welcome and lavish attentions upon negroes were stationed at the planter's gate where it opened on the post road or turnpike to hail travelers and assure them of a hearty welcome at the big house up yonder one writer says of the planters quote, this manner of living is most generous and open strangers are sought after with greediness to be invited unquote. the london magazine of the year seventeen forty three published a series of papers entitled itinerant observations in america it was written with a spirited pen which thus pleasantly describes simple maryland hospitality not of men of vast wealth but of very poor folk quote, with the meaner sort you find little else to drink but water amongst them when their cider is spent but the water is presented you by one of the barefooted family in a copious calabash with an innocent strain of good breeding and heartiness the cake baking on the hearth and the prodigious cleanliness of everything around you must needs put you in mind of the golden age the times of ancient frugality and purity all over the colony a universal hospitality reigns full tables and open doors the kind salute the generous detention speaks somewhat like the roast beef ages of our forefathers Unquote. 
there came a time when this southern hospitality became burdensome with the exhaustion of the soil and competition in tobacco raising the great wealth of the virginians was gone but visitors did not cease in fact they increase the generous welcome offered to kinsmen friends and occasional travelers were sought by curiosity hunters and tourists who wanted to save a tavern bill nothing could be more pathetic than the impoverishment of thomas jefferson through these impositions times and conditions had changed but jefferson felt bound in honor to himself and his state to keep the same open hand and ready welcome as of yore his overseer describes his own hopeless efforts to keep these travelling friends and admirers from eating his master out of house and home Quote, they were there all times of the year but about the middle of june the travel would commence from the lower part of the state to the springs and then there was a perfect throng of visitors they travelled in their own carriages and came in gangs the whole family with the carriages and riding horses and servants sometimes three or four such gangs at a time we had thirty-six stalls for horses and only used ten of them for the stock we kept there very often all the rest were full and i had to send horses off to another place i have often sent a wagon load of hay up to the stable and the next morning there would not be enough left to make a bird's nest i have killed a fine beef and it would all be eaten up in a day or two unquote. the final extinction of old-time hospitality in virginia came not from a death of hospitable intent but from an entire vanishing of the means to furnish entertainment and the civil war drove away even the lingering ghost many general customs existed in the early colonies which were simple exemplifications of neighborliness put in legal form such were the systems of common lands and herding this was an old aryan custom which existed many centuries ago and has ever been one of the best ways of uniting any settlement of people especially a new settlement for it makes the interest of one the interest of all and promotes union rather than selfishness common lands were set off and common herds existed in many of the northern colonies cowherds or cow keeps were appointed and paid by the town to care throughout the summer for all the cattle owned by the inhabitants this was an intelligent provision for it saved much work of individuals during the months when farmers had so much hard work to do and so short a time to do it in in albany and new york the cowherd had quote, a chosen proper youngster unquote. in other words a good steady boy went through the town at sunrise sounding a horn which the cattle heard and knew and they quickly followed him to green pastures outside the town there they lingered till nearly sunset when they were brought home to the church and the owners were again warned by the horn of the safe return of their cattle and that it was milking time sometimes the cowherd received part of his pay in butter or cheese in cambridge massachusetts cowherd rice in sixteen thirty five agreed to take charge of one hundred cows for three months for ten pounds the town also paid two men or boys to help him the first two weeks and one man a week longer he kept the cows alone after that 
for the intelligent cattle had fallen into habits of order and obedience to his horn he had to pay threepence fine each time he failed to bring in all the cattle at night on long island and in connecticut there were cowherds calf keepers and pound keepers the calf keepers duties were to keep the calves away from the cows water them protect them etc in virginia and maryland there were cow pens in early days and cow herds in the south the cattle generally roamed wild through the forests and were known to their owners by earmarks in all communities earmarks and other brands of ownership on cattle horses sheep and swine were very important and rigidly regarded where so much value was kept in domestic cattle these earmarks were registered by the town clerk in the town records and were usually described both in words and rude drawings one of my great-great-grandfather's earmarks for his cows was a swallow fork slit in both ears another was a slit under the ear and a halfpenny mark on the foreside of the near ear this custom of herding cattle in common lasted in some out-of-the-way places to this century and even lingered long in large cities such as boston where cows were allowed to feed on boston common till about eighteen forty in philadelphia until the year seventeen ninety five a cowherd stood every morning at the corner of dock and second streets blew his horn tramped off to a distant pasture followed by all the cows of his neighborhood who had run out to him as soon as they heard the familiar sound he led them back to the same place at night when each returned alone to her own home sheep herds or shepherds in colonial days also took charge of the sheep of many owners in herd walks or ranges by day and by night in sheepfolds built with fences and gates fence viewers were men who were appointed by the town for common benefit to take charge of building and keeping in repair the fences that surrounded the great lots or commons that is the enclosed fields which were the common property of each town in which all farmers living near could place their cattle the fence viewers saw that each man worked a certain amount each year on these pails as the fences were called or paid his share for the work of others each farmer or cow owner usually built about twenty feet of fence for each cow which he pastured in the great lots the fence viewers also examined the condition of fences around private lands noted breaks and ordered repairs for if cattle broke through a poorly made fence and did damage to crops the fence owner had to stand the loss while if the fences were good and strong proving the cattle unruly and destructive the owner of the cattle had to pay all the colonies were watchful over the safe keeping of fences in sixteen fifty nine the dutch rulers of new amsterdam now new york ordered that for stripping fences of rails and posts the offender should be whipped and branded and for a second offence he could be punished by death this seems cruelly severe but that year there was a great scarcity of grain and other food and if the fences were pulled down cattle could get into fields and eat up the growing crops and famine and death might result sometimes a common field was fenced in and planted with indian corn in this case the fence served to keep the cattle out not in this was always the case in virginia 
hay wards were as the name indicates men to keep watchful care over the growing hay for instance in hadley massachusetts in sixteen sixty one good man montague was chosen hay ward by the town he was to have twelve pence for each cow or hog two shillings for each horse and twenty pence for each twenty sheep that he found loose in any field or meadow and successfully turned out the owner of the animal was to pay the fine at a later date these hay wards were called field drivers they are still appointed in many towns and cities among them boston hog reeves were men appointed by the citizens to look after their hogs that roamed the roads and streets to see that all those swine had rings in their noses were properly marked and did not do damage to crops many towns had hog reeves till this century for until seventy years ago hogs ran freely everywhere even in the streets of our great cities it was a favorite jest to appoint a newly married man hog reeve when ralph waldo emerson was married and became a householder in concord the young philosopher was appointed to that office sometimes a single swineherd was hired to take care of the roving swine the two salem swineherds or swine keepers in 1640 were to have sixpence for each hog they drove daily to pasture from april to november these and many other public offices were simply a form of legalized cooperation a joining together of neighbors for public good the neighborly assistance given to new settlers began with the clearing of the ground for occupancy the girdling of trees was easy and speedy but it was discountenanced as dangerous and hideous and was not frequently practiced a chopping bee was a universal method among pioneers of clearing ground in newly settled districts or even in older townships in vermont new hampshire and maine where great tracts of land were left for many years in the original growth sometime this bee was held to clear land for a newly married man or a new neighbor or one who had had bad luck but it was just as freely given to a prosperous farmer though plentiful thanks and plentiful rum were the only rewards of the willing workers all the strong men of the township repaired at an early hour to the track to be cleared and with powerful blows attacked the great trees a favorite way of bringing the day's work and the day's excitement to a climax was by a drive this was made by chopping halfway into the trunks of a great group or circle of trees undercutting it was called so that by a few powerful and well-driven blows at the monarch of the group and perhaps a few well-concerted pulls on a rope the entire group could be felled together the leader bringing down with his spreading branches in his mighty fall his fellows in front of him and they in turn their neighbors with a crash that shook the earth and made the mountains ring it was dangerous work accidents were frequent the records of death at log rollings are pathetic to read and to think of in a country where the loss of a sturdy man meant so much to some struggling household a heavy and sudden gust of wind might blow down a small tree which had been carelessly undercut and thus give an unexpected and premature collapse of the simple machinery of the grand finale a century ago a new hampshire woman 
and her husband went out into the forest primeval. He cut down a few trees, made a little clearing termed a cut-down, wherein a tiny patch of sky and cloud and scant sunlight could be seen overhead, but no sunrise or sunset, and built a log house of a single room, a home. With the opening spring, with the opening spring came one day a group of kindly settlers from distant clearings and settlements, some riding from ten miles away the previous day. In front of the log house they chopped all the morning long with sturdy arms and swinging blows, yet fell nothing, till in the afternoon when all was ready for the final blow at the towering leader, which by its fall would lay low a great sloping track for a dooryard and home field. As the noble trees fell at last to the earth, with a resounding crash, lo, in the opening there appeared to the startled eyes of the settler's wife, as if rising out of heaven, a neighbor in her loneliness. Mount Cursage, grand, serene, and beautiful, crowned with the glories of the setting sun, standing guard over a smiling lake at its foot, and every day through her long and happy life till ninety-six years old, as she looked at the splendid mountain, standing as it will till time shall be no more, did she thank God for his gift for the noble companionship which came so suddenly, so inspiringly upon the cramped horizon of her lonely forest home. After the trees were all felled, it was no longer a cut-down, but an opening. This was made preferably in the spring. The fallen trees were left some months on the ground to dry in the summer sun, while the farmer turned to other work on his farm, or if he were starting in life, hired out for the summer. In the autumn the tops were set on fire, and the lighter limbs usually burnt out, leaving the great charred tree trunks. Then came what was known as a piling bee, a perfect riot of hard work, cinders and dirt. Usually the half-burned tree trunks were, quote, niggered off, unquote, in Indian fashion by burning across with a smaller stick of wood till the long log was in lengths which could be dragged by the farmers with their oxen and horses into vast piles and again set on fire another treat of rum accompanied this day's work the word log rolling was often applied to the latter bee and occasionally the felling of trees and dragging into piles for firing was done in a single log rolling sometimes before the opening was cleared it was planted the spring rains and melting snows carried the fertilizing ashes deep into the soil. Corn was planted and dug in. Rye was sowed and hacked in. The crops were astonishing. The grain grew among the fallen logs and stumps in rioting luxuriance. A stump pulling was another occasion for a friendly bee to clear off and put into comely shape the new field. Another exhibition of cooperation was in a stone hauling or a stone bee. Some of the rocky fields of hard New England would defy a lifetime of work of one man and a single yoke of oxen. With judicious blasting, many oxen, strong arms, and willing hearts, the boulders and ledges were tamed. Stone walls eight feet wide, such as may be seen in Hopkinton, New Hampshire, stand 
as monuments of the patience, strength, skill, and cooperation of our forebears. To show the struggle and hard work willingly done for a home, let me give the statement in 1870 of a respected citizen, the historian of Norwich Walk, Maine, when he was over ninety years old. He served an apprenticeship of eight years till he was twenty-one, then bought on credit a tract of fifty acres in the primeval woods. On eight acres he felled the trees and left them through the winter. In April 1801 he spent three weeks in burning off the logs and clearing as well as possible by handwork three acres. These he sowed with wheat and rye, buying the seed on credit. He hired a yoke of oxen for one day and did what harrowing he could in that short time, grubbing around the stumps with a hoe for two more days. The crop grew, as did all others on similar soil, amazingly. The two bushels of seed wheat yielded fifty-two bushels, the bushel of rye thirty bushels. On his other five acres among the fallen trees he planted corn and raised a hundred and twenty-eight bushels. He adds, quote, when I could leave my work on my new land, I worked out haying and other work. I made shoes in the fall, taught school in the winter, paid for my board and some clothing, but husbanded my resources to pay for my land. At the end of the year, found myself worth two hundred dollars. I continued to clear up four acres each year till I had cleared the fifty acres, planted an orchard, and erected suitable farm buildings and fences." Unquote. Six years later he married and prospered. In eleven years he was worth two thousand dollars. He filled during his long life many positions of trust and of profit, and did many and varied good deeds. He continued in active life till he was ninety years old. At his death he left a considerable fortune. It is an interesting picture of the value of honorable economy and thrift, a typical New England picture, with a certain vigor and stimulus about it that makes it pleasing. A raising might be of a church or a schoolhouse or of a house or barn for a neighbor. All the strong men, far and near, turned out to help. Tools were lent, and many strong hands and arms made quick work. Often the frame of a whole side of a house, the broad side, was fastened together on the ground. After it was laid out and pinned together, shores of long poles were attached to the plates with ox chains, and it was literally lifted into place by the united strength of the entire band of men and boys. Sometimes women pulled on the rope to express their goodwill and helpfulness. Then the other sides were put up, and the cross beams, braces, and studding all pinned and nailed into place. Afterwards the huge rafters were raised for the roof. Each man was assigned in the beginning to his place and work, and worked faithfully when his turn came. When the ridge pole was put in place, the building was christened, as it was called, by breaking over it a bottle of rum. Often the house was literally given a name. Sitting astride the ridge pole, one poet sang, quote, Here's a mighty fine frame, which deserves a good name. Say what shall we call it? The timbers are all straight, and was used first rate. The frame is well put together. It is a good frame that deserves a good name. Say, what shall we name it? Unquote. Another, a Rochester, New Hampshire frame, was celebrated in verse, which closed thus. The flower of the plain is the name of this frame. We've had exceeding good luck in raising the same. It was not 
luck that made these raisings a success it was skill and strength skill and powers of endurance which could overcome and surmount even the quantity of vile new england rum with which the workmen were plied throughout the day accidents were frequent and often fatal a great frame of a meeting-house or a vast barn with forty or fifty men at work on it could not collapse without loss of life and much injury of limb in the work of these raisings the highest as well as the humblest citizens took part truly a man could glow with the warmth of home even in a bare and scantily furnished house at the thought that the walls and rafters were held in place by the kind wishes and deeds of all his friends and neighbors there is nothing in nature so unnatural so singular in quality as the glittering artificiality of the early morning in the country of the day after a heavy drifting new england snowstorm for a day and a night the wildly whirling snow that quote, driving o'er fields seems nowhere to alight unquote, has restrained the outlook and every one has turned depressed from that outside life of loneliness and gloom the following morning always opens with an excessively bright and dazzling sunshine which is not like any other sunshine in any place or season but is wholly artificial like the limelight of a theatre we always run eagerly to the window to greet once more the signs of life and cheerfulness but the landscape is more devoid of life and reality than during any storm of wind and snow and sleet no matter how dark and lowering there is a changed aspect in everything it is metallic and everything is made of the same horrible white metal nothing seems familiar not only are the wanted forms and outlines vanished and all their varied textures and materials and beautiful diversity of color gone also but there is a steely immobility restraining everything which is so complete that it seems as if it were a shell that would never be broken Quote, we look upon a world unknown on nothing we can call our own Unquote. It is no longer a real landscape, but an artificial, encircling diorama of meaningless objects made of vast, unshaded sheets of white, glazed bristol board, painted with white enamel, warranted not to crack, with the garish highlights put in crystallized alum or possibly powdered glass. It is without life or atmosphere or reality. It has nothing but the million reflections of that artificial and repellent sunshine. In a quarter of an hour, even a few minutes, it is agonizingly monotonous to the spirit as it is painful to the eye. Then, like a veritable oasis of color and motion, in an unmovable glittering white desert, a sound and a sight, of beautiful and active life appears around the bend of the road comes slow and straining down the hill as has come through the glaring artificial sunlight after every heavy snowstorm for over a century past a long train of oxen with a snowplow Quote, breaking out unquote, the old post road beautiful emblems of patient and docile strength these splendid creatures are never so grateful to the sight as now their slow progress down the hill has many elements to make it interesting it is historic ever since the township was thickly settled enough for families to have any winter communication with each other whether for school church mail or doctor this road has been broken out in precisely this way 
in nearly all scattered townships in new england the custom prevails to-day just as it did a century and more ago even in large towns and a description of the present breaking out is that of the past also the work is now usually done in charge of road surveyors or the road masters who are often appointed from the remote points of the township there is therefore much friendly rivalry to see which surveyor will first reach the centre of the town and the tavern beginning at sunrise with his own yoke of oxen hitched to a snow-plough each roadmaster breaks through the drift to the nearest neighbour who adds his yoke to the other and so from neighbour to neighbour till sometimes fifteen or twenty yoke of oxen are hitched in a long line to the plough sometimes a pair of wild young steers are hitched plunging and kicking with the sober elders by this time the first yoke often begins to show signs of distress by lolling out the tongue a sure symptom of overwork in oxen and they are left at some farmer's barn to cool down whittier thus describes the scene of breaking out the winter roads in his snowbound quote, next morn we waken with the shout of merry voices high and clear and saw the teamsters drawing near to break the drifted highway out down the long hillside treading slow we saw the half-buried oxen go shaking the snow from heads up tossed their straining nostrils white with frost before our door the strangling train drew up an added team to gain the elders threshed their hands a cold passed with cider mug their jokes from lip to lip unquote. thus are the white snowways and the drifted roads turned by cheerful cooperation into a midwinter visiting where every neighbor can exchange greetings with the other young and old for of course school does not keep and the boys crowd on the snowplow or try their new snowshoes and the men of the various families who do not go with the oxen hitch up the sleighs pods and pungs and follow the snowplow and the young men send a volley of snowballs against every house where any fair maid lives and at the tavern in the afternoon is a great sight greater in anti-temperance days than now scores of yoke of oxen at the door the horse sheds full of horses and sleigh all the lads and men of the township within there is rivalry in the method of breaking one roadmaster always used a snow-plow another lashed an ordinary plow on either side of a narrow ox-sled a third used a coarse harrow weighted down with a group of standing boys this broke up the drifts in a wonderful manner the deeper drifts often have to be shoveled out partly by hand after the road to the tavern is broken the road to the schoolhouse the doctor's house and the meeting-house come next the roads thus made were not permitted in former days to be cut up idly by careless use many townships forbade by law the use of narrow sleds and sleighs the roads were narrow at best often when two sleighs met the horses had to be unharnessed and the sleighs passed over each other on lonely hill roads or straight turnpikes where teamsters could see some distance ahead turnouts were made where one sleigh could wait for another to pass after there had been a heavy fall of snow and the roads were well broken the time was always chosen where any logging was done to haul logs to the sawmill on ox sleds an interesting sled was used which had an interesting name chabobbin one writer called it a cross between a tree and a bobsled it was made by a close ingenious adaptation of natural forms of wood which made excellent runners crossbars etc 
they were fastened together so loosely that they readily adjusted themselves to the inequalities of the wood roads the word and article are now almost obsolete in some localities chebobbin became tobobbin and tarboggin all three being adaptations in nomenclature as they were in form of the indian toboggan or moose sled a sledge with runners or flat bottom of wood or bark upon which the red men drew heavy loads over the snow this sledge has become familiar to us in the light of the strong canadian form now used for the delightful winter sport of tobogganing on these chebobbins great logs were hitched together by chains and dragged down from the upland woodlots under these mighty loads the snow tracks got an almost icy polish prime sledding for country sleighing parties sometimes a logging bee was made to clear a special lot for a neighbor and a band of wood choppers worked all day together it was cheerful work though the men had to stand all day in the snow and the thermometer was below zero but there was no cutting wind in the forest and the exercise kept the blood warm many a time a hardy man would drop his axe to wipe the sweat from his brow loose woolen frocks or long shorts two or three over each other were warm as are the overlapping feathers of a bird a few had buckskin or sheepskin waistcoats their hands were warmly covered with home-knit mittens in later days all had heavy well-greased boots but in the early years of such pioneer settlements as in the towns of new hampshire and vermont all could not afford to wear boots their place was well supplied by heavy woolen stockings shoes and an overcovering of old stockings or cloth soaked in neat's foot oil this was deemed a positive preventive of frozen feet it was the custom both among men and women to join forces on a smaller scale and have a little neighborly visiting by what was called change work for instance if two neighbors both were to make soap or both to make apple butter or both to make up a rag carpet instead of each woman sitting at home alone sewing and fitting the carpet one would take her thimble and go to spend the day and the two would sew all day long finish and lay the carpet at one house in a few days the visit would be returned and the second carpet be finished sometimes the work was easier when the two worked together one man could load logs and sled down to the sawmill alone but two by change work could accomplish the task much more rapidly and with less strain even those evil days of new england households the annual house cleaning were robbed of some of their dismal terrors by what was known as a wang a gathering of a few friendly women neighbors to assist one another in that dire time and thus speed and shorten the hours of misery for any details of domestic life of colonial days the reader has ever to turn to the diary of judge samuel sewell of boston just as a student of english life of the same date turns to the diary of samuel pepys sewell was a puritan of the narrow type of the later days of puritanism and there is little of warmth or beauty in his pages save that throughout them there shines the gentle radiance the unconscious record of a pure and never-dying neighborliness the neighborliness of an upright and reserved but deeply tender christian no thoughtful person can read the simple and meagre but wholly self-forgetful entries which reveal this trait of character without a feeling of profound respect and even affection for sewell he was the richest man in town and one of the most dignified of citizens a busy man full of many cares and plans but he watched by the bedside of his sick and dying neighbors those of humble station as well as, as well as his friends and kinsfolk nursing them with tender care praying with them 
bringing appetizing gifts and also giving pecuniary aid to the household he afforded even more homely examples of neighborly feeling he sent quote, tastes of his dinner unquote many times to friends and neighbors this pleasant custom lingered till the present day in new england i saw last summer several times covered treasures of housewifery being carried in petty amounts literally a taste to tempt tired appetites or lonely diners the gift of a portion of the overbountiful supply for the supper of a wedding a reception etc went by the expressive name of cold party in rural pennsylvania a charming and friendly custom prevailed among country folk of all nationalities the metzel soup the taste of sausage making this is the anglicized form of metzel soupy meltzen means to kill and cut to pieces especially for sausage meat when each farmer butchered and made sausage a great dish heaped with eight or ten pounds of the new sausages was sent to each intimate friend the recipient would in turn send metzel soup when his family killed and made sausage if the metzel soup was not returned the minister promptly learned of it and set at work to effect a reconciliation between the offended parties the custom is dying out and in many towns is wholly vanished sewell seemed to regard it as a duty and doubtless it was also a pleasure to pray for and with dying friends his is not the only old-time diary that i have read in which those long prayers are recorded nor are his surprised occasional records of the impatience of dying friends the only ones i have seen a very sick man even though he were a puritan might occasionally tire of the prayers of laymen sewell was ever ready to signify his good will and interest in his neighbor's advancing fortunes by driving a nail at a shipbuilding or a pin at a house raising by laying a stone in a wall or a foundation of a house the latter apparently in the case of some very humble homes he the judge of the supreme court served on the watch walking and guarding the streets of his neighbor's safety just as faithfully as did the humblest citizen end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of home life in colonial days by alice morse earl this librivox recording is in the public domain old-time flower gardens adjoining the street through which i always in my childhood walk slowly each sunday on my way to and from church was a spot to detain lingering footsteps a beautiful garden laid out and tenanted like the gardens of colonial days and serene with the atmosphere of a worthy old age a garden which had been tended for over half a century by a withered old man and his wife whose golden wedding was spent in the house they had built and in the garden they had planted when they were bride and groom his back was permanently bowed with constant weeding and pruning and planting and hoeing and his hands and face were brown as the soil he cultivated the hot glowing crimson peonies seedling which the wife had sown in her youth had become great shrubs fifteen or twenty feet 
in circumference. The flowering shrubs were trees. Vigorous borders of box crowded across the paths and towered on either side, till one could scarcely walk through them. There were beautiful fairy groves of foxgloves, gloriously freckled, purple and white, and tall Canterbury bells, and at stiffly regular intervals were set flowering almonds, St. Peter's wreath, Persian lilacs, Moses in the burning bush, which shrub was rare in our town, and laburnums rich in streaming gold, syringas ivory pure. At the lower ends of the flower borders were rows of honey blob, gooseberries, and aged currant bushes, gray with years, overhung by a few patriarchal quince and crab apple trees, in whose low spreading gnarled branches I spent many a summer afternoon, a happy visitor, though my own home garden was just as beautiful, old fashioned, and flower filled. The varying grades of city streets had gradually risen around the garden until it lay depressed several feet below the level of the adjoining streets, a pleasant valley like Avalon. Quote, deep meadowed happy fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer seas unquote. a flight of stone steps led down to it steps very steep narrow and slippery with green moss and ladies delights that crowded and blossomed in every crack and crevice of the stones. On each side arose terraces to the street, and in the spring these terraces flushed a mass of vivid glowing rose color from blooming moss pink, forming such a glory that pious church-going folk from the other end of town did not think it wicked to walk thither on a Sunday morn in May to look at the rosy banks that sloped to the valleyed garden as they had walked there in February or March to see, quote, winter slumbering in the open air, where on his smiling face a dream of spring, unquote in the shape of the first crocuses and snowdrops that opened beside a snowdrift still lingering on a shaded bank and to watch the first benumbed honey-bees who greeted every flower that bloomed in that cherished spot and who buzzed in bleak march winds over the purple crocus and the blue flushing grape hyacinth as cheerfully as though they were sipping the scarlet poppies in sunny August. The garden edges and the street were overhung by graceful larches and by thorny honey locust trees that bore on their trunks great clusters of powerful spines and sheltered in their branches an exceedingly unpleasant species of fat, fuzzy caterpillars which always chose Sunday to drop on my garments as I walked to church, and to go with me to meeting, and in the middle of the long prayer to parade on my neck, to my startled disgust, and agitated whisking away, and consequent reproof for being noisy in meeting. What fragrances arose from that old garden, and were wafted out to passer-by the ever-present pungent dry aroma of box was overcome or tempered through the summer months by a succession of delicate flower scents that hung over the garden veil like an imperceptible mist 
perhaps the most perfect and clear among memory's retrospective treasures was the pale fringed snow pink and later sweet william with its homely cottage smell flocks and ten weeks stock were there as everywhere the last sweet-scented flowers of autumn at no time was this old garden sweeter than in the twilight the eventide when all the great clumps of snowy flocks night rockets and luminous evening primrose and all the tangles of pale yellow and white honeysuckle shone irradiated when quote, in puffs of balm and night air blows the burden which the day foregoes unquote. and the scents far richer than any of the day the spiced air of night floated out in the dusky gloaming though the old garden had many fragrant leaves and flowers their delicate perfume was sometimes fairly deadened by an almost mephitic aroma that came from an ancient blossom a favorite in shakespeare's day the jewel bell of the noxious crown imperial this stately flower with its rich color and pearly drops has through its evil scent been firmly banished from our garden borders one of the most cheerful flowers of this and my mother's garden was the happy-faced little pansy that under various fanciful folk names has ever been loved like montgomery's daisy it blossomed everywhere its italian name means idle thoughts the german little stepmother spencer called it ponzi shakespeare said maidens called it love in idleness and drayton named it heart ease dr pryor gives these names herb trinity three faces under a hood fancy flammy kiss me pull me cuddle me unto you tickle my fancy kiss me ere i rise jump up and kiss me kiss me at the garden gate pink of my joan to these let me add the new england folk names bird's eye garden gate johnny jump up kit run about none so pretty and ladies delight all these testify to the affectionate and intimate friendship felt for this laughing and fairly speaking little garden face not the least of whose endearing qualities was that after a half-warm snow-melting week in january or february this brightsome little delight often opened a tiny blossom to greet and cheer us a true jump up and kiss me and prove by its blooming the truth of the graceful chinese verse ere man is aware that the spring is here the plants have found it out another dearly loved spring flower was the daffodil the favorite also of old english dramatists and poets and of modern authors as well when we find that keats names a daffodil as the thing of beauty that is a joy forever perhaps the happiest and most poetic picture of daffodils is that of dora wardsworth when she speaks of them as quote, gay and glancing and laughing with the wind unquote. perdita in the winter tales thus describes them in her ever quoted list quote, daffodils that come before the swallow dares and takes the winds of march with beauty unquote. most cheerful and sunny of all our spring flowers they have never lost their old-time popularity and they still laugh at our bleak march winds 
bouncing bet and her comely hardy cousins of the pink family made delights of many a corner of some home garden the pinks were jove's own flowers and the carthusian pink china pink clove pink snow pink plumes pink mullion pink sweet william maltese cross ragged robin catchfly and campion all made gay and sweet the summer the clove pink was the ancestor of all the carnations the richest autumnal glory came from the cheerful marigold the goldie of chaucer and the merry bud of shakespeare this flower beloved of all the old writers as deeply suggestive and emblematic has been coldly neglected by modern poets as for a while it was banished from modern town gardens but it may regain its popularity in verse as it has in cultivation in farm gardens it has always flourished and every autumn has gone to bed with the sun and with him risen weeping and has given forth in the autumn air its acrid odor which to me is not disagreeable though my old herbal calls it quote, a very naughty smell unquote. a favorite shrub in our garden as in every country courtyard was southern wood or ladies love a sprig of it was carried to meeting each summer sunday by many old ladies and with its finely dissected bluish-green foliage and clean pungent scent it was pleasant to see in the meeting-house and pleasant to sniff at the virtues of flowers took a prominent place in the descriptions in old-time botanies the southernwood had strong medicinal qualities and was used to cure quote, vanities of the head unquote. Quote, take a quantity of southern wood and put it upon kindled coals to burn being made into powder mix it with the oil of radishes and anoint a bald place and you shall see great experiences unquote. it was of power as a love charm if you placed a spring in each shoe and wore it through the day when you were in love you would then also in some way quote, see great experiences unquote. in the tender glamour of happy association all flowers in the old garden seem to have been loved save the garish petunias whose sickish odor grew more offensive and more powerful at nightfall and made me long to tear them away from their dainty garden fellows and the portulaca with its fleshy worm-like stems and leaves and its aggressively pushy habits quote, never would be missed unquote. Perhaps its close relation to the pusley, most hated of weeds, makes us eye it askance. There was one attribute of the old-time garden, one part of nature's economy, which added much to its charm. It was the crowding abundance and overfulness of leaf, bud, and blossom. Nature there displayed no bare expanses of naked soil, as in some too carefully kept modern parterre. The dull earth was covered with a tangle of ready-growing, self-sowing, lowly flowers that filled every space left unoccupied by statelier garden favorites, and crowded every corner with cheerful though unostentatious bloom and the close juxtaposition and even intermingling of flowers with herbs vegetables and fruits gave a sense of homely simplicity and usefulness as well as of beauty the soft purple eyes of the morning bride were no less lovely to us in our garden because they opened under the shade of currant and gooseberry bushes and the sweet alisum and candy tuff were no less honey-sweet 
the delicate pink-purple hues of the sweet peas were not dimmed by the vivid neighbors at the end of the row of poles the scarlet runners the adlumia or mountain fringe was a special vine of our own and known by a special name virgin's bower with its delicate leaves almost as beautiful as a maidenhair fern and its dainty pink flower it festooned the ripening corn as wantonly and luxuriantly as it encircled the snowball and lilac bushes though colored herbs were cultivated in england in the seventeenth and eighteenth century as carefully as were flowers striped hollies variegated myrtles and bays being the gardener's pride yet in our old american gardens few plants were grown for their variegated or odd-colored foliage the familiar and ever-present ribbon grass also called striped grass canary grass and gardener's garters whose pretty expanded panicles formed an almost tropical effect at the base of the garden hedge the variegated wandering jew the striped leaves of some varieties of day-lilies the dusty miller with its frosty pow which was probably a house-plant filled the short list the blocks was the sole evergreen and may i not enter here a plea for the preservation of the box edgings of our old garden borders i know they are almost obsolete have been winter killed and sunburned and are even in sorry disrepute as having a graveyard association and as being harbourers of unpleasant and unwelcome garden visitors one lover of old ways thus indignantly mourns their passing quote, i spoke of box hedgings we used to see them in little country gardens with paths of crude earth nowadays it has been discovered that box harbors slugs and we are beginning to have beds with tiled borders while the walks are of asphalt for a pleasure round in dante's inferno such materials might be suitable unquote. for its beauty in winter alone the box should still find a place in our gardens it grows to great size bushes of box in the deserted garden at vaucluse in newport rhode island are fifteen feet in height and over them spread the branches of forest trees that have sprung up in the garden beds since the neglected plaisance was planted over a century ago the beautiful border and hedges of box at mount vernon the home of washington plead for fresh popularity for this old-time favorite our mothers and grandmothers came honestly by their love of gardens they inherited this affection from their puritan quaker or dutch forebears perhaps from the days when the famous hanging gardens of babylon were made for a woman bacon says quote, a garden is the purest of human pleasures it is the greatest refreshment to the spirit of man unquote. A garden was certainly the greatest refreshment to the spirits of a woman in the early colonial days, and the purest of her pleasures, too often her only pleasure. Quickly, in tender memory of her uh, English home, the homesick good wife, trying to create a semblance of the birthplace she still loved, planted the seeds and roots of homely english flowers and herbs that grew and blossomed under bleak new england skies and on rocky new england shores as sturdily and cheerfully as they had sprung up and bloomed by the green hedgerows and doorsides in the home beyond the sea in the year sixteen thirty eight and again in sixteen sixty three an english gentleman named john jocelyn came to new england 
He published in 1672 an account of these two visits. He was a man of polite reading and of culture, and as was the high fashion for gentlemen of his day, had a taste for gardening and botany. He made interesting lists of plants which he noted in America under these heads. Quote, one such plants as are common with us in england two such plants as are proper to the country three such plants as are proper to the country and have no names four such plants as have sprung up since the english planted and kept cattle in new england five such garden herbs among us as do thrive there and of such as do not Unquote. this last division is the one that specially interests us since it is the earliest and the fullest account of the gardens of our forefathers after they had tamed the rugged shores of the new world and made them obey the rule of english husbandry they had quote, good store of garden vegetables and herbs lettuce sorrel parsley mallows chevrel burnet summer savory winter savory thyme sage carrots parsnips beets radishes purslain beans cabbage growing exceedingly well peas of all sorts and the best in the world asparagus thrives exceedingly muskmelons cucumbers and pompions unquote. for grains there were wheat rye barley and oats there were other garden herbs and garden flowers spearmint pennyroyal ground ivy coriander dill tansy quote, feverfew prospereth exceedingly white satin groweth pretty well and so doth lavender cotton gilly flowers will continue two years horseleek prospereth notably hollyhocks comfrey with white flowers clary lasts but one summer sweet briar or eglantine celadine but slowly bloodwort but sorrily but patience and english roses very pleasantly unquote. patience and english roses very pleasantly in truth must have shown their fair english faces to english women in the strange land dearly loved had these briar roses or dog roses been in england where says the old herbalist gerard quote, children with delight make chains and pretty gewgaws of the fruit and the cooks and gentlewomen make tarts and such like dishes for pleasure thereof unquote. ollyhawks feverfew and gillyflowers must have made a sunshine in the shady places in the new home many of these garden herbs are now common weeds or roadside blossoms celadine even a century ago was quote, common by fences and among rubbish unquote. tansy and ella campaign grow everywhere sweet briar is at home in new england pastures and roadsides spearmint edges our brooks ground ivy is a naturalized citizen it is easy to note that the flowers and herbs beloved in gardens and medicinal waters and kitchens at home were the ones transplanted here clary water was a favorite tonic of englishmen of that day the list of quote, such plants as have sprung up since the english planted unquote, should be of interest to everyone who has any sense of sentiment of association 
or interest in laws of succession the spanish proverb says quote, more in the garden grows than the gardener sows unquote. the plantain has a history full of romance its old northern names widstrit in german wegri in dutch vbred in danish and waybred in old english are indicating its presence in the much trodden paths of man were not lost in its new home nor were its characteristics overlooked by the nature noting and plant knowing red man it was called by the indians the englishman's foot says jocelyn and by calm also a later traveller in seventeen forty for they say where an englishman trod there grew a plantain in each footstep not less closely did such old garden weeds as motherwort groundsel chickweed and wild mustard cling to the white man they are old colonists brought over by the first settlers and still thrive and triumph in every kitchen garden and backyard in the land mullion and nettle henbane and wormwood are all english immigrants the puritans were not the only flower lovers in the new land the pennsylvania quakers and the mennonites were quick to plant gardens pastorius encouraged all the germantown settlers to raise flowers as well as fruit whittier says of him in his pennsylvania pilgrim quote, the flowers his boyhood knew smiled at his door the same in form and you and on his vines the rainish clusters grew unquote. it gives one a pleasant notion of the old quaker george fox to read his bequest by will of a tract of land near Philadelphia for a playground for children of the town to play on and for a garden to plant with physical plants for lads and lassies to know simples and to learn to make oils and ointments. Among Pennsylvanians the art of gardening reached the highest point. The landscape gardening was a reproduction of the best in England our modern country places cannot equal in this respect the colonial country seats near philadelphia woodlands and bush hill the homes of the hamiltons clevedon of chief justice chu fairhill belmont the estate of judge peters were splendid examples an ecstatic account of the glories and wonders of some of them was written just after the revolution by a visitor who fully understood their treasures the rev manasseh cutler the clergyman statesman and botanist in newport rhode island where flowers ever seemed to thrive with extraordinary luxuriance there were handsome gardens in the eighteenth century a description of mr bowler's garden during the revolution reads thus quote, it contains four acres and has a grand isle in the middle near the middle is an oval surrounded with espaliers of fruit trees in the centre of which is a pedestal on which is an armillary sphere with an equatorial dial on one side of the front is a hothouse containing orange trees some ripe some green some blooms and various other fruit trees of the exotic kind and curious flowers at the lower end of the aisle is a large summer house a long square containing three rooms the middle paved with marble and hung with landscapes on the right is a large private library adorned with curious carvings there are espaliers of fruit trees at each end of the garden and curious flowering shrubs the room on the left is beautifully designed for music and contains a spinet but the whole garden discovered the desolations of war unquote. in the southern colonies men of wealth soon had beautiful gardens in an early account of south carolina written in sixteen eighty two we find quote, 
their gardens are supplied with such european plants and herbs as are necessary for the kitchen and they begin to be beautiful and adorned with such flowers as to the smell or eye are pleasing or agreeable viz the rose tulip carnation lily etc unquote. by the middle of the century many exquisite gardens could be seen in charleston and they were the pride of southern colonial dames those of mrs lambole mrs hopton and mrs logan were the largest the latter flower lover in seventeen seventy nine when seventy years old wrote a trustee on flower raising called the gardener's calendar which was read and used for many years mrs lawrence had another splendid garden those southern ladies and their gardeners constantly sent specimens to england and received others in return the letters of the day especially those of eliza lucas pickney ever interested in floriculture and arboriculture showed a constant exchange with english flower lovers beverly wrote of virginia in seventeen twenty quote, a garden is nowhere sooner made than there unquote. William Byrd and other travelers a few years later saw many beautiful terrace gardens in Virginia homes. Mrs. Anne Grant writes at length of the love and care the Dutch women of the past century had for flowers. Quote, the care of the plants such as needed peculiar care or skill to rear them was the female province every one in town or country had a garden into the garden no foot of man intruded after it was dug in the spring i think i see yet what i have so often beheld a respectable mistress of a family going out to her garden in an april morning with her great calash her little painted basket of seeds, and her rake over her shoulders to her garden of labors. A woman in very easy circumstances and abundantly gentle in form and manners would sow and plant and rake incessantly. Unquote. In New York before the Revolution were many beautiful gardens, such as that as Madame Alexander on Broad Street, where in their proper season grew pos blomen of all hues, laylocks and tall may roses and snowballs intermixed with choice vegetable and herbs, all bounded and hemmed in by huge rows of neatly clipped box edgings. We have a pretty picture also in the letters of Catherine Rutherford of an entire company gathering rose leaves in June in Madame Clark's garden and setting the rose still at work to turn their sweet scented spoils into rose water. A trade in flower and vegetable seeds formed a lucrative and popular means by which women could earn a livelihood in colonial days. I have seen in one of the dingy little newspaper sheets of those days in the large total of nine advertisements contained therein the announcement by five Boston seed women of lists of their wares. The earliest of names of flower seeds which I have chanced to note was in the Boston Evening Post of March 1760 and is of much interest as showing to us with exactness the flowers beloved and sought for at that time they were hollyhook purple stock white lupins africans blue lupins candy tuff cyanus pink wallflower double larkinspur venus navel wart Brompton Flock, Priceless Feather, Balsam, Sweet Scented Peas, Carnation, Sweet Williams, Annual Stock, Sweet Phoebus, Yellow Lupins, Sunflower, Convolus Minor, Catchfly, Ten Week Stock, 
globe thistle globe amaranthus nigella love lies bleeding cassent hamen polyanthus canterbury bells carnation poppy india pink convolus major queen margaret's unquote. This is certainly a pretty list of flowers, nearly all of which are still loved, though sometimes under other names. Thus the Queen Margaret are our asters, and the homely old English names seem to bring the flowers to our very sight, for we do not seem to be on very friendly intimacy, on very sociable terms with flowers, unless they have what Miss Mitford calls decent, well-wearing English names. We can have no flower memories, no affections that cling to botanical nomenclature, yet nothing is more fatal to an exact flower knowledge to an acquaintance that shall ever be more than local than a too confident dependence on the folk names of flowers our bachelor's buttons are a ragged sailors in a neighboring state they are corn pinks in plymouth ragged ladies in another town blue bottles in england but cyanus everywhere ragged robin is in the garden of one friend a pink in another it flaunts as london pride while the true glowing london pride has half a dozen pseudonyms in as many different localities and only really recognizes itself in the botany an american cowslip is not an english cowslip an american primrose is no english primrose and the english daisy is no country friend of ours in america what cheerful and appropriate furnishings the old-time gardens had benches full of straw bee-keeps and wooden beehives those homelike and busy dwelling places frequently also a well-filled dovecot sometimes was seen a sundial once the everyday friend and suggestive monitor of all who wandered among the flowers of an hour now known alas only to the antiquary sentiment and even spirituality seem suggested by the sundial yet few remain to cast their instructive shadow before our sight one stood for years in the old box-bordered garden at homogansett farm at wickford in old narragansett governor endicott's dial is in the essex institute at salem and my forebear jacob fairbanks had one dated sixteen fifty which is now in the rooms of the dedham historical society dr bowditch of boston had a sundial which was thus inscribed Quote, with warning hand i mark time's rapid flight from life's glad morning to its solemn night and like god's love i also show there's light above me by the shade below Unquote. another god dial thus gives in long lean letters its warning word Quote, you'll mend your ways to-morrow when blooms that budded flower mortal learn to your sorrow death may creep with his arrow and pierce your vital marrow long ere my warning shadow can mark that hour Unquote. these dials are all of heavy metal usually lead sometimes with gnomon of brass but i have heard of one that was unique it was cut in box at the edge of the farm garden often stood the well sweep one of the most picturesque adjuncts of the country dooryard its successor the roofed well with bucket stone and chain and even the homely long-handled pump had a certain appropriateness as part of the garden furnishings so many thoughts crowd upon us in regard to the old garden one is the age of its flowers we have no older inhabitants than these garden plants they are old settlers clumps of flower de luce 
double buttercups peonies yellow daylilies are certainly seventy-five years old many lilac bushes a century old still bloom in new england and syringas and flowering currants are as old as the elms and locusts that shade them this established constancy and yearly recurrence of bloom is one of the garden's many charms to those who have known and loved an old garden in which there grows no strange flowers every year but when spring winds blow o'er the pleasant places the same dear things lift up the same fair faces and faithfully tell and retell the story of the changing seasons by their growth blossom and decay nothing can seem more artificial than the modern show-beds of full-grown plants which are removed by assiduous gardeners as soon as they are flowered to be replaced by others only in turn to bloom and disappear these seem to form a real garden no more than does a child's posy bed stuck with short stem flowers to wither in a morning and the tiresome tasteless ribbon beds of our day were preceded in earlier centuries by figured beds of diverse colored earths and of both we can say with bacon quote, they be but toys you may see as good sights many times in tarts unquote. the promise to noah quote, while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest shall not cease unquote. when heated in the garden brings various interest the seed time the springing up of familiar favorites and the cherishing of these favorites through their ingathering of seeds or bulbs or roots for another year bring pleasure as much as does their inflorescence another pathetic trait of many of the old-time flowers should not be overlooked their persistent clinging to life after they have been exiled from the trim garden borders where they first saw the chill sun of a new england spring you see them growing and blooming outside the garden fence against old stone walls where their uptorn roots have been thrown to make place for new and more popular favorites you find them cheerfully spreading, pushing along the footpaths, turning into vagrants, becoming flaunting weeds. You see them climbing here and there, trying to hide the deserted chimneys of their early homes, or wandering over and hiding the untrodden footpaths of other days. A vivid imagination can shape many a story of their life in the interval between their first careful planting in colonial gardens and their neglected exile in highways and byways where the poor bits of depauperated earth can grow no more lucrative harvest the sites of colonial houses which are now destroyed the trend almost the exact line of old roads can be traced by the cheerful faces of these garden strays the situation of old fort nassau in pennsylvania no longer a matter of uncertainty is said to have been definitely determined by the familiar garden flowers found growing on one of these disputed sites it is a tender thought that this indelible mark is left upon the face of our native land through the affection of our forebears for their gardens the botany tells us that the bouncing bet has escaped from cultivation she has been thrust out but unresentfully lives and smiles opening her tender pinky opalescent flowers adown the dusty roadsides and even on barren gravel beds in railroad cuts butter and eggs tansy chamomile spiked loose strife velvet leaf bladder campion cypress spurge live forever star of bethlehem money vine all have seen better days but now are flower tramps even the larkspur beloved of children the moss pink 
and the grape hyacinth may sometimes be seen growing in country fields and byways the homely and cheerful blossoms of the orange tawny ephemeral lily and the spotted tiger lily whose gaudy colors glow from the warmth of far cathay their early home now make gay many of our roadsides and crowd upon the sweet cinnamon roses of our grandmothers which also are undaunted garden exile drive once along a country road i saw on the edge of a field an expanse of yellow bloom which seemed to be an unfamiliar field tint it proved to be a vast bed of coreopsis self-sown from year to year and the blackened outlines of an old cellar wall in its midst showed that in the field once stood a home once there a garden smiled i am always sure when i see bouncing bet butter and eggs and tawny lilies growing in a tangle together that in their midst may be found an untrodden doorstone a fallen chimney or a filled-in well still broader field expanses are filled with old country plants in june a golden glory of bud and blossom covers the hills and fields of essex county in massachusetts from lynn to danvers and ryleside to beverly it is the english gorse or wood wax and by tradition it was first brought to this country in spray and seed as a packing for some of the household belongings of governor endicott thrown out in friendly soil the seeds took root and there remain in the vicinity of their first american homes it is a stubborn squatter yielding only to sith plow and hoe combined chicory or blueweed was it is said brought from england by governor bowden as food for his sheep it has spread till its extended presence has been a startling surprise to all english visiting botanists it hurts no one's fields for it invades chiefly waste and neglected land the dear common flower and it has redeemed many a city suburb of vacant lots and many a railroad ash heap from the abomination of desolation white weed or oxide daisy a far greater pest than gorse or chicory has been carried intentionally to many a township by homesick settlers whose descendants to-day rule the sentiment of their ancestors while the valley garden of our old neighbors was sweet with blossoms my mother's garden bore a still fresher fragrance that of green growing things of posies lemon balm rose geranium mint and sage i always associated with it in spring the scent of the strawberry bush or calicanthus and in summer of the fraxinella with its tall stem of larkspur like flowers its still more graceful seed vessels and its shining ash-like leaves grew there in rich profusion and gave forth from leafy stem blossom and seed a pure a memory sweet perfume half like lavender half like anise truly much of our tenderest love of flowers comes from association and many are lovingly recalled solely by their odors balmier breath than was ever borne by blossom is to me the pure pungent perfume of ambrosia rightly named as fit for the gods not the miserable weed ambrosia of the botany but a lowly herb that grew throughout the entire summer everywhere in our garden sowing its seeds broadcast from year to year springing up unchecked in every unoccupied corner and under every shrub and bushy plant giving out from serrated leaf an irregular race me of tiny pale green flowers a spicy aromatic fragrance 
if we brushed past it or pulled a weed from amongst it as we strolled down the garden walk and it is our very own i have never seen it elsewhere than at my old home and in the gardens of neighbors to whom its seeds are given by the gentle hand that planted our garden and made it a delight goethe says quote, some flowers are lovely to the eye but others are lovely to the heart ambrosia is lovely to my heart for it was my mother's favorite and each spring comes slowly up the way i say in the words of solomon quote, awake o north wind and come thou south blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out unquote. that the balm and mint the thyme and southern wood the sweet briar and ambrosia may spring afresh and shed their tender incense to the memory of my mother who planted them and loved their pure fragrance and at whose present as at that of eve flowers ever sprung Quote, and touched by her fair tendance gladlier grew Unquote. End of chapter 17 End of Home Life in Colonial Times by Alice Morse Earle